A couple months ago, former President Donald Trump had his private residence, Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach, Florida, raided by the FBI who had a search warrant and were operating under the guise of their investigation into his supposed handling of classified documents, which is, of course, one of two federal investigations that Trump is currently under, the other one pertaining to January 6th, which is a whole other discussion fundamentally, but it's kind of the same in effect because if you've been following the saga for a while, then you'll remember when it was President Obama illegally spying on Trump's campaign back in 2016. You'll remember when it was the Russia collusion hoax, when it was supposed to be Mueller time. You'll remember the two impeachment attempts. You'll remember the literal and shameless equating of January 6th with 9-11, the incessant attacks on his character. Of course, every anonymously sourced tabloid scandal in between that circulated throughout the media as if they were gospel. You're talking gemstones of investigative journalism, such as the P-tape, finally all leading up to where we are now, with his most influential allies being targeted by the federal government while he's greeted with a subpoena from the January 6th committee. Now, there are essentially two ways of viewing this, which we'll discuss. But it's undeniably a fact that there has never been in the history of this country a political figure who, along with their allies and with their supporters, has faced a greater level of persecution at virtually every conceivable level. It's just never happened before. It's never been more syndicated. It's never been more relentless. And it's never been more vicious. Like, this is just a fact. But people want to be like, oh, well, what about this guy? This guy got full on assassinated. Like, OK, thank you. I hadn't considered that. Very measured, very insightful contribution. Thank you for that. But the point is that you cannot point to another example in American history where this level of persecution has been ordered against a political figure, let alone a former president. And people who don't like Trump will say, well, it's because he broke the law and he was mean. It's like, okay, an alleged heir in filing documents according to the National Archives. So what, he like pissed off the top librarian in the nation? Yeah, lock him in a cell, throw away the key. This is just one of the sobering realities of politics, which has always been the case. And people know this, but they don't actively think about it and trace its implications. And that's that there is no such thing as a nation of laws. The people who pull the strings are always going to reward and make exceptions for themselves and for their friends. And they're always going going to persecute their enemies. And we don't have time to get into the actual uh, criminal syndicates in this country. We certainly don't have time to point out all of the hypocrisy. But if your actual argument is that this level of persecution against Trump is warranted because he didn't handle documents correctly, he incited a riot, and as a billionaire Manhattan businessman, he maybe got a little creative with his taxes, you're just not a serious person. Like, just say you hate Trump because you think he's mean. There would actually be more dignity in that. But you don't have to lie. Because if you asked any person in the street about insider trading that goes on in D.C., about the corruption, about the exploitation of children, the warmongering, the trafficking, the planned demolition of our country. Most people would agree, but most people are also sheep and therefore they won't extrapolate and ask themselves, why is it that none of those people are ever being treated the way that Trump is being treated? Are we really supposed to believe that we've like designed a system where all of the best and most virtuous and most noble people have occupied the highest levels of power? What you come to realize if you're an honest person is that everybody has baggage, everybody has dirt. There are literally people whose job it is to like find all these things out about you to do opposition research and find out what you've got buried in your closet. And so what you come to realize is that the distinction in politics isn't so much about who's a perfect person and who's not, but rather who's actually serving the system and who's actually challenging the system. People who claim to be challenging the system on the left are propped up as poster children. They get to pose on magazine covers because they're still voting for war, because they're still voting for mass immigration, because they're totally controlled. And people on the right who claim to be challenging the system, they still get to make millions of dollars. They still get to be on social media, but because they're a member of the opposition party, they also understand that they're going to have to have their two minutes of hate on occasion uh, from the media and whatnot, because ultimately they face no level of persecution that has real teeth because they're still voting for the same things. They just play the heel character, which they're happy to do. And you'll notice as well with Trump, when he announced that he was running, they gave him a hard time for some of the comments that he was making. Yeah, but he was still hosting Saturday Night Live. He was still doing interviews on primetime television. He was still allowed on social media. He was still publicly associating with many of his famous friends. And this is something that now seems completely unimaginable, but it makes sense because if you rewatch that coverage that went on during the 2016 cycle, yeah, Trump was great for ratings, but nobody really took him seriously. And then by the time they realized that they needed to take him seriously, it was too late. And people will hear things like this and they'll roll their eyes at it like, well, you really think that Donald Trump is a threat to the system because they want to characterize him as this buffoon or they'll say, well, what do you mean by system? You know, you sound like a conspiracy theorist. And it's like, okay, to that, I would simply recall the Supreme Court precedents on pornography. You know it when you see it, like we can sit here and reduce it to abstraction. 
or a bullet point list. But the bottom line is that there is a way that things go in this country. There is an established consensus. And no matter who holds power, things like mass third world immigration, things like wars for democracy, nation building, offshoring our manufacturing base, flooding our country with drugs, destroying the innocence of children, destroying the economic prospects of the American people, destroying their heritage. All of these things just tend to happen, regardless of who is like nominally in control of each branch of government. More importantly, these things are all pillars of our system. They're not accessories to it, which means that these are things that are outside of the parameters of the debate. So you might disagree with these things. You might want these things to change, but ultimately nobody who has ever seriously wanted any of these things to change has ever been allowed to get anywhere near the levers of power that would actually be necessary to do so. These are all features of our machine. They're not glitches. And Donald Trump is the only one who so far did, and the only one who so far could actually pose a threat to the system that we have in this country. And if you think I'm like a Trump fanatic or something, which honestly, like, okay, fair, but you, you at least have to hear the reasons for that, right? Like this isn't blind fanaticism, at least give me that much because there's no incentive to grift for Trump anymore. Like even ignoring that I've supported this man for the last seven years, all of the grifters have moved on to supporting people like Ron DeSantis, who I like because he's a safer option in their opinion. Or these are people who were against Trump in 2016. They capitalize on the momentum to benefit themselves. Now they're abandoning Trump uh, and just following the tide as decided by their neocon overlords, which is what grift do. And so we will discuss this at length as we continue. The real money and the real attention right now is in selling people a new idea, a new way forward, a fresh candidate. Ah, well, let's try voting for this guy. This time that'll work. And I'm not doing that. I've supported Trump for seven years. I've criticized him thoroughly when I thought he needed to do better, which was often, frankly, which the grifters got mad at me for doing back then because they're grifters. And I will continue to support Trump. And I have many well thought out reasons for doing this. So it's your prerogative to write me off as a grifter or as a fanatic, but you just be honest for doing so. And here's something I think we all really need to remember. We are people who follow politics very closely. And because of that, I think it's easy to get complacent in the cycle of things. Like I remember having a Romney Ryan desktop background back in 2012. Granted, that was before I knew what was going on. I was 12, but still I was excited about the sport of politics, so to speak. You know, every candidate is always gonna have a certain level of excitement and energy behind them. It's fun, it's competitive, it's merchandised, but you step back out of it and you kind of realize that there are examples of this that are truly exceptional. And the same goes with the supposed opposition to these candidates. Like, yeah, they called Reagan a fascist. Yeah, they compared Bush to Hitler. But notice how these people all still get together and speak kindly of each other, because a lot of that opposition is nothing more than political theater or aggrandizing or distracting the respective bases. But again, if you step back out of that cycle, you realize that there are examples of this that are truly exceptional. Yeah, the tactics may be more or less the same, but the level of viciousness and relentlessness against these people and the complete syndication of these attacks, it's actually unique only to Donald Trump. That's just a fact. You know, I even remember I remember going to George Bush rallies at the Pontiac Silverdome back in 2004. I remember going to Trump rallies in 2016, but these things are very different. The atmosphere and more importantly, what they represent are very different. And so to understand Trump and more importantly, the dynamics against Trump, because anybody with average intelligence at this point, and at least an honest bone or two in their body will understand how uniquely intense these attacks are against Trump. And so at that point, there seemed to be two interpretations. Either A, Trump is just a terrible candidate, which is why they're attacking him so much. And clearly we should move on to somebody else, or B, there actually is something about Trump that these people are very threatened by, and we should figure out what that thing is so we can protect it and really lean into it, because the system is very good at defending itself from outside threats. And as much as it maybe wastes resources on promoting stupid things, it doesn't play games when it comes to defending itself. If you are perceived to be a threat, you will be seriously attacked. And so we have to view Donald Trump as more than just an interesting Republican candidate, more than just a popular president, but rather something that actually transcends that someone who is quite literally a once in a lifetime political figure, not just another candidate, that would be an inaccurate label. And maybe you disagree. Maybe you think I'm, I'm silly for saying that I'm a fanatic, but irrespective of that, the political establishment in this country actually seems to agree with me because they are treating him exactly with the contempt and persecution that we would expect someone with the profile that I assigned to Trump to be treated. And this isn't even speculative, like it goes beyond assumptions. We can actually prove this. They are legitimately threatened by Donald Trump. And like we said, people forget. People forget this because they're spoiled. They take this new momentum for granted because they're so caught up in the cycle of politics that they forget how bad it used to be for us. Like, do you remember who our options were in 2016? What did Marco Rubio, rising star Marco Rubio, talk about in his 2016 campaign announcement? He talked about how the greatest thing about America is that it allows immigrants from all over the world to come here 
and work hard to create a better life for themselves. How we have the American dream for everybody. He talked about how our military was weak, which is bad because it won't be able to protect our allies. So in other words, America is great because it's an economic zone for the rest of the world. And it's great because it's a Kevlar vest for the rest of the world. And we have to keep it that way. So vote for me. And people literally thought that Donald Trump was like a Clinton plant to stop Marco Rubio, the real threat to the establishment. This was an actual thought back then. Or what about Jeb Bush? He was the front runner before Trump. What did he talk about in his campaign announcement? He talked about limited government, cutting spending. Okay, I mean, I guess that sounds pretty good. He talked about our military needing to be strong so that we can defend our allies. Okay, I guess that sounds good. And then he literally spoke Spanish and said that we need to be more loving to our neighbors in Mexico. Right. What did Trump talk about? No, Mexico isn't sending their best folks. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. He's talking about how countries are robbing us of our wealth, of our young men and women. They're laughing at us. Nobody's proud to be an American anymore. We've become a dumping ground for everybody else's problems. They're taking advantage of us. We've poured trillions of dollars into wars for other countries. We've received no benefits for doing so. We're sending all of our jobs to other countries. And most importantly, we will make America great again. That is the distinction. Everybody else wants to keep you entranced by this false George W. Bush style patriotism where everybody just wants to wave the flag and say America's the best. Oh, oh no, but it's in danger. So you have to give me money and power so I can keep it the best for you. And Trump goes, no, actually, America's the laughing stock of the world because of this poor excuse for a leadership class that we have. And so we're going to go ahead and make America great again. And that is something that actually resonated with people because, yeah, maybe they generally agree with the messaging from everybody else. But before Donald Trump descended from the goal, an escalator, the American people literally did not even know that they had those grievances as options. Nobody ever spoke about them. They were settled. They were beyond the scope of debate. The experts said so. And which message is it that gets people off the couch to vote for the first time, or again for the first time in decades? We know the answer to that question, and no amount of astroturfing from neocon publications and outlets can change that reality. So as much as we hear now about better leaders and better governors, the bottom line is that before Donald Trump, the state of right-wing politics in this country was people like Jeb Bush. Before Donald Trump, the state of right-wing politics in Florida was people like Jeb Bush, but people like to forget that. And I'm not throwing shade here. I reiterate, I like DeSantis. I'm really happy with a lot of what's happening in Florida. But if you're talking about true leadership, Passing bills at the state level where you have significant majorities in both chambers of state Congress is not a serious comparison to single-handedly shattering what was for decades a virtual and unquestionable consensus in right-wing American politics. Real. So you've got the direct persecution of Trump and his movement, but that's not enough, right? You have to weaken the movement from within. So what do you do? You exploit the biggest weakness that the right has, which we all know is weakness. It's cowardice. They manufacture all of this baggage that Trump has, and they never shut up about it. Oh, Russia, Ukraine, Access Hollywood, Diet Coke, literally who cares? This isn't even baggage. It's totally manufactured, and it's designed to make you go, oh, well, maybe we should support someone less problematic or well, someone more electable. And they're doing this because they intend on it working. Because if there's one thing that conservatives love, it's throwing their best people under the bus once the establishment puts a little bit of pressure on them, which, like we mentioned earlier, is done in the first place precisely because they know that these people are actually threatening to their power structure. So they're trying to sow discord. They're trying to sow doubt within the right right now. And look, I understand the criticisms. I do. I just don't think they're correct. We'll get more into that. But in terms of why would you rally behind somebody so divisive, somebody who everybody hates, even ignoring the fact that all of that is purposefully manufactured precisely to get you to want to abandon Trump, I don't see another shot. They are going to do this to anybody who threatens them. And Trump is the only guy with the money, the ego, the charisma, and the name recognition to get the job done. He's totally independent of their power. Otherwise, why would they persecute him? Why would they want to undermine Trump so badly? And okay, even if that's true, why should we care about a guy who's not even president and who didn't even accomplish a lot of what he set out to do while he was president? We have to read the writing on the walls. But to understand why they want Trump gone so badly, we first have to understand why he was elected in the first place. Because when you reach a certain stage of political turmoil, politics becomes less about issues per se and more about who's going to protect me from the enemy. And right now, Trump is the only one who has the potential to do that. He has his own money. 
His ego is too big to quit, frankly. His charisma captures every room that he walks into and everybody knows who he is. He is too big to fail. They can't stop him. Everybody else, when all is said and done, ultimately can be controlled, even if they truly are a force of opposition. But there does exist a point where somebody has too much money and influence to be controlled. That's why, in addition to persecuting him directly, you've got Republican establishment people trying to make people doubt Trump by talking about the baggage that their friends have invented and propagated. That's why the state is looking to take action against him and for the media to stir up everybody and create so much manufactured hysteria that Republicans cave and decide to run somebody less problematic, which is the stupidest thing that we could do for reasons that we'll get into. And that's why ultimately they're trying to make it legally impossible for Trump to run again because he simply will never quit. And no one would ever buy a fortification the second time around, especially with how disastrous the administration of the supposedly most popular presidents in history has done, and even more so with everything that's been done in the meantime to prevent that from occurring again. So what can you do to stop him? What do you do in that situation? You've got this guy who will never quit. You've got his base who is too dedicated to really care about all the baggage that you claim he has, aside from a few cowardly examples. So how do you stop that momentum if you're working in the political establishment? You don't stop it. You try to redirect it. You need a pressure release valve. You need Ron DeSantis. Again, I like DeSantis. I don't think he's necessarily acting maliciously, but all of a sudden in the last year or so, you've seen a lot of this DeSantis versus Trump talk emerging from the same outlets and publications that were never Trump in 2016. My dad actually gave me credit for this on the phone recently, calling out the DeSantis stuff over a year ago, which I appreciated, because I just started to notice all of these outlets all of a sudden were inventing this showdown between uh, Trump and DeSantis. And I'm like, oh, they're gonna try it, aren't they? Because here's the bottom line. The way that these people cheered against Trump during the debates in 2016, all of the lobbyists and staffers and donors and special interests, did they actually become sold on Trump? No, they're still vipers and they're just biding their time lurking in the shadows. Remember, it was almost Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, Jeb Bush, Scott Walker, etc. People were like excited about this. These are all good politicians, but I don't think any person truly believes that all we need to get our country and ourselves out of this situation is a handful of good politicians. And herein lies the problem. All of these people are whispering in DeSantis's ear because they want him to run against Trump in 24, because they want a return to politics as usual. And whether or not DeSantis likes it, in order for him to actually get the resources to try to take on Trump, he's gonna have to get into bed with the literal worst people in the world who are just foaming at the mouth, begging him to do it because they want to return to a pre-Trump GOP and they see that opportunity in Ron DeSantis. They want Trumpism without Trump, which as we'll discuss is impossible, but that's the point. And you can see this with Joe Biden's speech, which was a declaration of war against Trump supporters specifically, against the idea of making America great again specifically, where the GOP and DeSantis tried to respond to it as a political attack on half the country, people who disagree with them politically. That's not what Biden said, though. He said specifically Trump supporters. But the GOP wants to frame it like it was about them because they have to. They have to play the victim, right? Like that's the political theater, pretending like Biden and the left are actually threatened by establishment GOP leadership. So they're trying to make noise. They're trying to get your attention. Oh, ow, ow, I'm absorbing the blow. This was about me. Here, now here's this strategy for fighting back, which ultimately serves the same class of people that ordered this speech in the first place. This is controlled opposition. Position, by the way, we know that. This is also exactly what I predicted was gonna happen two years ago when I made my What Happens If Trump Loses video. That's maybe beside the point, but it's unfolding now. I mean, they're not trying to represent you. They're trying to contain you. And again, this is a movement, okay? We're reasonable. We understand that passing the torch is inevitable. Nobody's saying that Trump is gonna be the guy forever, but we have to make sure that when we're passing the torch, we are doing it at the right time, giving it to the right person and for the right reasons. But for the time being, it is still Trump's torch and it is still Trump's movement. And there's been a lot of talk about this in the last few months. And so I just wanna make it perfectly clear, it is still Donald Trump. And to all the DeSantis fans, to the people living in Florida, I'm glad that you have a governor who wants to do his job properly. I love a lot of what he's done in Florida. He's doing a fine job, but we all want what's best. And so this is a friendly heads up that you're probably not gonna like a lot of what we get into with DeSantis, and that's fine, but we have to get into it nonetheless because it's true. And I'm afraid that what we're gonna see after the midterms after the GOP establishment is done fundraising off Trump's name, I'm afraid what we're gonna see is an official shift away from Trump and attempt to screw him out of 2024 in order to prop up somebody more electable, as if electable means anything other than who will get the most votes and win the election, who will have the base most excited, who will inspire people to vote again for the first time in decades after having given up on our entire political system. Donald Trump is obviously that man. And we have a lot of evidence for this to get into, but anyways, I may end up hurting some feelings. Bear with me, okay? Please 
please watch all the way through because we're going to touch on a lot of things. Watch it in parts if you have to. Two rules. You have to watch all the way through and you can't get mad at me until the end because we're going to address the elephants in the room, okay? This will be something of an autopsy on the first Trump administration, but it's also going to go over a lot of the frankly ridiculous anti-Trump arguments that we keep hearing from people on our side, how he's supposedly too divisive, how he supposedly didn't get anything done, how he promoted the jab, things like that. We'll address the Trump versus DeSantis, uh, who's a better leader, who's a better governor, who would get things done, the difference between the two, why this uh, persecution is happening, who stands to benefit from it, the entire web of relationships between the federal government, the FBI, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, the deep state, Ron DeSantis, the GOP establishment, among some other things, why Trump is exceptional, uh, the Biden speech declaring war on Trump supporters, the curious response from the GOP and Ron DeSantis, what good red state governing looks like, the future of the right the right wing, and by extension, the future of our country. Uh, and we will be going over all of it. So please do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. Look, we've got to stop doing this. I mean, you and I, this separation, it really, it just isn't good for either of us spending this much time apart from each other. Nobody wins when we do that. And we like to win. That much I will tell you. But in all seriousness, do you want like an explanation? Do you want the inside baseball? Because I know I've been gone for a while. I know that I've been missed. So do you want me to kind of update you as to what's been going on behind the scenes or what's going on? All right, well, hey, that's fine by me, but it's actually quite fitting that after so much time off, we discuss these things at length because a lot has happened in these last few months and all the things that we're gonna get into here, namely the feds, the establishment, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, all of these things can be used to accurately assess and analyze our current political dynamic in terms of how they relate to each other uh, and what they represent. And that's very important, actually. What do all of these things names, institutions, whatever, what do they actually represent in relation to the American people at the current time? So we'll actually get a pretty good update on our political dynamic from all this. And we're going to jump around because we got a lot to go through. Of course, I have to urge you, stay tuned, watch all the way through, watch it in parts if you have to, but just be sure to hear me out all the way through because we've got a lot to go over and we're very excited about it. We're also very excited about the upcoming debate I'll be doing at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville on November 14th. So if you're in the area, you'd like to attend, I'll put a link with all that information in the description. Uh, but you know what else we're excited about? Shameless product placement. Hey, you, if you go to the local clothing store where the Soy Boys shop, you might notice that the price of boxers has gone through the roof. And just to make matters worse, the material is cheap. These brands, they're run by people who hate you, but you're not a Soy Boy, you're a Doy Boy. That's why you need Undertag, the only brand that has literally been battle tested by special forces. The greatest boxers ever made because they cover all the bases. High quality material that's antibacterial, anti-pilling and moisture wicking, so you stay fresh all day long. They come with a sturdy yet comfortable extra wide waistband, it's durable, ultra light, fade resistant, shrink resistant. Here's the best part. It's almost 30% less than the competition. Getundertack.com, that's getundertack.com, 20% off site wide with the offer code DOYLE20. And if that's not enough, Undertack donates a portion of its profits to veteran run organizations that are actively fighting human trafficking. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Every time you buy Undertack, a libtard gets into a car accident. That's power you can't buy, except you can. At getundertack.com, that's get undertack.com offer code doyle 20 very epic we continue so like we mentioned earlier in the intro which may have even been the longest intro in the history of hawk i mean many people are saying this that's what i'm hearing i don't know but all of this persecution against trump is because the political establishment on both sides even though it's technically like all the same thing man whatever that political establishment sees a legitimate threat in the momentum created by donald trump and so they've never stopped the persecution and this is even carried over into his life outside of the white house in the last two years or so which is of course on unprecedented for a former president. Uh, and they've even escalated the severity of this persecution in terms of the like actual long-term consequences of it because media slander, that's one thing. Federal prosecution, that's another because they're trying to prevent him from running again in 2024. That's the investigations, that's the committees, that's the lawsuit in New York with the attorney general. That's all of that. And you can tell yourself it's because they like really just give a damn about having high quality statesmen, but literally any metric by which you would choose to replicate that would say that you're just absolutely wrong. It's because it's Trump. So, so 
Of course, they're trying to get Trump to balk. They're trying to turn up the heat to where he's just like, you know what? I've had enough of this. I'm just going to go back to living my luxurious lifestyle without having to deal with the nonsense that you people literally never stop. But because Trump is Trump, his ego is incapable of doing that. He'll just never stop. And he rightfully feels as though he's been mistreated throughout his entire, uh, you know, I guess, political adventure. And he's not going to stop until he achieves something approximating a personal sense of justice. And his supporters see that too. And for that reason, they also literally will never stop. They will not balk. They will not give up on Trump so long as Trump does not give up on them. And the only people who have left the Trump train are the usual suspects. These are your neocons, your neo-never Trumpers, people who never liked Trump in the first place, but for the sake of their careers, they kept their mouths shut. They waited for the opportunity to try to return things to the status quo, and they're being very sneaky with how they're going about doing this. Like you'll notice with the FBI raid in particular, they obviously had to cover it because it was so unprecedented and it was so extreme, but you'll notice that the popular talking point in terms of why we should be opposed to it was, well, if they can go after Trump like this, well, then they're going to go after you like this. Like, listen very closely to what that means and, and to what that implies. If Trump now, then you next. This is not actually the case. They just want to go after you by continuing to ruin and loot your country. Like, if you're an average GOP voter, you probably don't need to worry too soon about the FBI attacking you. So you're not supporting Trump here because, well, this could happen to any of us, but rather because it's happening specifically to him and only to him because he's the only actual threat to the established order in this country. And they want to prevent him from running again in 2024 by any means necessary, literally. And that's the problem with the way that they framed this. It frames the issue in a very traditional pre-Trump dressing, which is essentially that the problem here is government overreach and going after someone who you disagree with politically. Politically. And, and we need to stand against this now because if we don't, well, then pretty soon all of our private resorts are going to be raided by the nanny state. If they get Trump now, well, pretty soon they'll be going after Paul Ryan. And you'll notice this with a lot of what we're going to be talking about. It's all specifically curated to try to put you back in the cage, back in the box of pre-Trump right-wing politics. And some people will say, oh, well, what about the raiding of houses of the political opposition under the guide of combating you know, extremism and domestic terrorism? Yeah, huge problem, but they're already doing that. And it's not just their political opposition. That's too vague. That includes far too many people who we don't like. It's specifically Trump's biggest supporters who get locked up as political prisoners. And then also people who dare advocate against the crown jewel of American liberalism, which is the ritual sacrifice of the unborn. So they're trying to demoralize us while aggrandizing their own base midterms. It is what it is. So the point of this is just to say that the biggest asset that we currently have as American patriots is Donald J. Trump. Fact. And that's why they're going after him. It's not exactly like this slippery slope scenario where they want to do that to him to set precedent for when they do it to you. It's, it's more like they're just going to do it to you anyways. And the coalition that he has is the only legitimate impediment to that happening. Like, who actually believes at this point that precedence even matters? Like, oh, the pendulum's going to swing back. Who even believes that? Like, do you think that these people care about appearing impartial? The left doesn't care about any kind of precedent that their persecution is going to set because they don't even expect to ever be out of power in any meaningful way ever again. Like, even on the off chance that the GOP manages to assemble enough guys with a spine, the left owns the FBI. They own the media, the rest of the deep state, no matter how the election goes. That's why the precedent doesn't matter. Like, the election doesn't touch the critical parts of the machine unless you get someone in there who has the blueprints and wants to just destroy the whole thing. That's why they have to do anything necessary to stop Trump. Because you don't just build a political machine of this magnitude and then like, oh, here you go. Just hand it over to the other side because 51% of the masses said so. That's why the executive branch, it might change its figurehead but the deep state remains until you get someone in there who knows how to burn it to the ground. But we've seen how strong their defense is against that, of course. So the real problem here, and this is the big lesson that we all should have learned throughout the Trump years, it's not necessarily the existence or the size of the state of power, broadly speaking, but rather who's in charge of it. People who haven't caught up to this, they're just, they're not quite going to make it. The problem is that it happened to Trump specifically, precisely because they want to prevent him from running in 2024, because the system is completely corrupt, it's totally compromised, and he's the only one who actually has the potential to change that. If on January 22nd, 2017, the FBI were raiding properties owned by the Clintons, by the Podestas, the Obamas, the Epsteins, et cetera, et cetera, I would endorse that. That wouldn't be government overreach. That would just be epic. Like, we all wanted that to happen. That still Still needs to happen. Um, and we all know why. But I hope that I'm articulating that point sufficiently, that the problem isn't necessarily uh, this, you know, extreme government overreach and, oh, you know, if we don't stop now, well, then it's going to happen to all of us. 
guess it's that they would never do anything like that to anybody who they don't perceive to be a very real and a very serious threat to their establishment, which again is totally hostile to the American people. And so if you frame it otherwise, it suggests that the system is fundamentally good, but it's become a bit overzealous. It just needs to you know, wrangle it back a bit, just a little bit of tweaking. This of course isn't the case. It's because the system is rotten. It's toxic at its core and it needs to be purged, so to, so to speak. Um, and that's another thing that we'll talk about extensively the problem of people who claim they're on our side, but they still have this like fundamental faith in the system, this fundamental faith in the establishment. Oh, well, it's just a matter of getting a good politician into office, a respectable one, and then we can go back to politics as usual. Like, no, we need someone who's talking about just burning the whole thing down. And only Donald Trump is talking about doing that. Only Donald Trump is talking about purging the bureaucracy. And only Donald Trump is attracting the people who would be able to do that having openly learned his lesson from the previous administration. These other characters, they they aren't attracting that stock of people. They're attracting, conversely, the same like neocon DC scum. That's who's orbiting them. And you'll notice too that this is always the case with the neo never Trumpers. They still fundamentally have faith in the system. They actually view language about burning the whole thing down to be unsophisticated. They view it to be like low class. It's uneducated. They'll actually wince at it because you know they learned better when they got their master's in public policy degree from George Washington University. And that really that does explain it all. They've just got this bizarre faith in the system because it makes them feel smarter than the people who just want to like burn the whole thing down. So yeah, but what if they prosecute Trump? At this point, it's like, what's the difference? You know, oh, DC jury. Ooh, very scary. Maybe there's a protest. Even then only like a hundred people are going to show up. We're not very good at that. They would still probably deploy the National Guard, use it as a photo op to further the uh, political persecution of specifically Trump supporters, and they'd call it a sequel to January 6th. But the point is that the political establishment knows exactly what it's doing. The GOP needs Donald Trump right now because the fact of the matter is that only Donald Trump's name can energize the base in the way that they want for midterms. But after the midterms are over, pay very close attention to the way that the GOP is treating Donald Trump. Pay very close attention to the actions of Ron DeSantis after he wins re-election in Florida. Pay very close attention to the way that the GOP starts to act towards Ron DeSantis. Right now, they're happy to use the name and the momentum of Donald Trump to fundraise, but after the midterms are over, I think you're going to start to see their true colors be revealed. And the other side of the political establishment is, of course, trying to prevent him from being the nominee as well. So they're going to run the same play of going all the way. So, of course, the spineless conservatives agree on the general sentiment, but not the extremes. <laughs> Obviously, Trump shouldn't run in 2024, but going to prison? That seems a little extreme. Here's the thing that the cowards don't understand. Literally nobody cares. There's a certain conversation that one has to have with themselves before voting for Donald Trump, before accepting the Don into one's heart, which is basically this. I don't care about the Access Hollywood tape. I don't care about the tweets. I don't care about the lack of filter. I actually like them. They're coming for my children. They're erasing my history. They're taking my money. I need somebody who's gonna go after these people. Because like we said, at this stage of political decline and turmoil, it's not as much about issues. It's about who is going to protect you from the enemy. And the left, through Biden's speech, has declared Trump supporters, normal Americans, to be the enemy. So the people who would be offended by this, the cowards, are outweighed by the people who are inspired by this. This meaning the legitimate threat to the political establishment that they know has failed them, that has raped them, sold them out, humiliated them, and Trump knows that, and he wants revenge. He's been punished. They raided his son's bedroom. They've done nothing but try to humiliate him for the last seven years. Most of his friends have turned on him. They're trying to send his other son to prison for nothing, literally nothing. They're doing the same thing to him. If you think he's not going to try to go in there and burn this whole thing down or die trying, you are mistaken. You need to stop reading op-eds from your favorite pundits. Start reading about the great political power struggles of history. Start reading about the great declines of empires. We're not above our cycle of history because there has never been a political figure as popular as Trump. I can defend that statement. In America, in America, I mean, in the last hundred years or so, because it's not just about states won. I mean, people are saying they love Trump. They literally love Donald Trump. Where else have you seen this in American history? People still fly Trump flags. They still wear the MAGA hats. They've got the bumper stickers, not just because they forgot to take them off. They are choosing to keep them on. Whenever have you seen this level of support? Continued for a candidate who didn't even stay in Oval Office. 
please spare me the electoral maps of days past. Riddle me this instead. Who, with the current demographics and institutional monopolization in this country, would actually get more votes than Donald Trump? This is not Nixon or Reagan's America anymore. Find me somebody who can get the crowds that Trump can. There are rising stars, I agree. Very good, very talented people emerging, but for the time being, it is absolutely Trump's movement. That is where the momentum is, that is where the base is, and that is from where the trajectory needs to continue. Anybody who right now is trying to get us to move past Trump is doing at least one of three things. They're acting maliciously, they're masturbating to their self-perception of a smart political person, which typically is rooted in class insecurity, or they're failing to sufficiently read the room. In other words, if you're off the Trump train, it's because you're either retarded, gay, or evil, or some combination of the three. This cannot be refuted. But like, okay, maybe it's the persecution he's facing. Maybe it's actually because they're threatened by Donald Trump, but why? What is it about Donald Trump that is so threatening? You know, you keep saying that, John, but what do you actually mean by this? Well, firstly, everything that I've said about him so far and everything that I will say about him here, tell me that I'm wrong. Like you can dislike Trump, that's fine, that's your prerogative, but I'm not wrong about these things. And just like in my What Happens If Trump Loses video, you will see that as time passes, the points that we're making here will be completely vindicated. And look, I get it. Do I think that Trump is the sole answer to all of our problems, that he's just gonna fix everything? No, I've never claimed that. Do I think he's gonna save the world? No, but at the same time, What's wrong with having political heroes? Like, should we just instead get our hero fix from the Marvel Cinematic Universe like the rest of America? Like, the only relevant difference between a political hero and a historical hero is, like, whether you were alive at the same time or something. It's like it's like Iran said after we killed uh, Soleimani and people were wondering if they were going to retaliate. Iran's like, how could we when all of their heroes are fictional? Like, are we supposed to kill Spider-Man? Are we supposed to kill SpongeBob? And here's the biggest thing. It's not even necessarily just Trump, but the people who would be inspired by him and want to work along alongside him in forwarding his agenda. That's the key. And obviously there were some severe personnel errors in the first administration, which now even Trump seems to acknowledge himself. But the point is that while every president is going to attract bad people who want to exploit them to get closer to the levers of power, only somebody with the messaging and the momentum that Donald Trump has would attract the people who are both good and capable of actually enacting positive change in this country. These people aren't inspired by what the pre-Trump GOP was offering. And Trump truly does inspire people. Like Trump, firstly, is the most popular Republican ever. That's a fact. And he's lit a fire in this country of world historical proportions. That is also a fact. And he inspires people like no other candidate that we've ever seen in our lifetimes. And people take this for granted. People take for granted that Trump went up against like a dozen politically trained Ivy League lawyers and made them sweat and stutter like idiots. Like who else can do that? Michael Bloomberg tried. Everyone thought, oh, he and Trump, they're cut from the same cloth. New York billionaires. Elizabeth Warren comes out, chews him up and spits him back out like it was nothing. Go watch Ron DeSantis debate against Andrew Gillum in 2018 or the one he just did about Charlie Crist. It's not even close. And in fact, DeSantis, he maybe even had a bit of a hard time. I don't know. Again, I'm not taking shots at DeSantis. I'm not saying he's bad. I like him. I just have to reaffirm that Trump is just so exceptionally good, and I'm tired of watching people be psyoped by establishment neocon media into forgetting that. But it's always that fundamental faith in the establishment. I mean, they look at Trump who didn't get anything done, like, sure, okay, and they think that's an error on his part exclusively, like, hey, this guy who ran a campaign on restructuring our entire political system faced unprecedented roadblocks and persecution from people in the GOP establishment who claimed to be on his side, but ultimately, and with intention, subverted his administration. <laughs> what a loser. We'll get more in depth of this as we continue. But these people are able to think that because they can't comprehend how bad things actually are. You just have to vote in the right, respectable, experienced person into office. The only reason voting for somebody who's a part of the establishment makes sense is if you believe the establishment actually has the answers to the problems that are faced by the American people. The opposite of this is actually the case, whereas our establishment is actually like what imposes upon us easily 90% of the problems that we face as a country. And that's probably even a conservative estimate. The establishment is the disease. That's the enemy. That's the problem. And it's essentially incapable of offering a solution to like itself, right? That's the whole point. It's very good at preserving itself. It's very sophisticated. But there's a certain requisite psychology that's necessary to understand that. You probably know what I'm talking about because it's probably very frustrating to you as well because in order to understand this, you really have to have a certain level of like agency. <laughs> like 
it, it really is agency, you know, this sort of willingness to accept uncomfortable truths, it's willingness to disregard the opinions of others, or to just generally like break through herd consensus. And it's also just like this general thirst for truth, like a general wanting to know, wanting to follow the trail, wanting to go down the rabbit hole or what have you. But I think all of that can best be summarized by an individual's overall agency. And we've talked about this before, but unfortunately, most people just do not have agency. That's just human nature. It is what it is. And so even for people who are interested in politics, for a lot of people, it's like a fetish. Like they really derive an almost sexual level of pleasure from just subscribing to the stupidest ideas and worldviews. I'm talking about otherwise reasonable people. These are people who might even vote Republican, but it's just like a power LARP to them. It's like, it's a game. That's really what it is. It's like, whether it's neocons or libertarians or whoever, it's, you're literally like playing this tabletop RPG with them. And they're like, Maha, I'm a wise wizard and we wizards use deception to control our foes. Your unguided mind can know the truth. Foolish, only my crystal ball can conjure knowledge. It's like, okay. So can we talk about the rise in violent crime or can we talk, well, ha, I'm Michael Malice, the wise wizard. Don't you know that violent crime on public transportation is caused by government intervention? Ha ha ha, my attack weakens you by 10 HP. What am I, that's what, I'm trying to think of what I was thinking, uh, what it reminds me of. It reminds me of that South Park episode when Mark Zuckerberg is just going around the town harassing people. That's the same thing. It's like, okay, Cool, we get it. You're like this super serious political junkie. You're not like buying into the whole Trump momentum. Cool, can we stop LARPing now? Like, can we just be honest with ourselves now? It's the horseshoe theory of practical intelligence once again. You've got the low IQ people and they wear two hats, the MAGA hat and the tinfoil hat. And then you've got the high IQ people who speak of these things very matter of factly because it's not as exciting or romantic to them. It's just like, you know, whatever. And then you've got these people in the middle, these midwits, the 115 IQ people who exist in this false controlled dichotomy between uh, well, the system is good, actually. Uh, it just needs a little bit of tweaking versus oh, any system is bad. We should ask the system to delete itself. And then they start making out with each other. You are gay. This system is the problem. We're smart enough to have a good system. We had a better system, and we still have the time and the resources and the stock of people to correct course, though not for much longer. So this conservative movement, it doesn't actually seek to represent you against the system. It's not a legitimate opposition party. It seeks to contain you. It seeks to control artificial the parameters of the debate. That's, that's why anybody who steps out of line gets purged. And anybody with integrity is prevented from achieving a significant level of influence or power. And it's been that way for decades, all until somebody who had achieved that level of influence and power independently of it just decided to try to plug himself into it as a hobby about seven years ago. <sighs> but we can solve those problems in a matter of literally minutes. Thank you. Don't say that I'll start to cry and that wouldn't be good for my image. We don't want to, you don't want to see me cry. I'll start to cry. You know, one of the fake news. But one thing I've noticed is that people want to try to use his popularity as a way to insult normal Americans by saying it's like motivated by this stupid fanatical cult worship, but they absolutely refuse to consider because they view themselves as their own type of expert class. They absolutely refuse to consider that maybe Trump's popularity can best be explained actually by the fact that he is the first president in most people's lifetimes to so accurately and so precisely reflect their actual interests and attitudes about their country. Like we talked about this earlier. People People did not know that these things were even on the menu. And when they were on the menu with figures like Pat Buchanan, establishment conservative media worked overtime actively to make sure that nobody knew about it. But Trump is too big to fail. I mean, he's a household name. He's got his own money. They couldn't stop him. Like, is it any wonder that the political establishment, which is openly resentful and hostile towards the people over whom it governs, is it any wonder why they want to do away with him so badly? Again, show me one other political figure in the history of this country that has been persecuted to this extent by the establishment. You cannot do this. Show me one time in this country's history where it was worse off because of the incumbent regime. You can't. Oh, well, the Civil War, literally not even then. Oh, well, this guy got assassinated. You probably only know about the presidents who were assassinated and you probably only know about half of them, and you probably don't even know which half of that half actually had it coming, frankly. Anyways, 
Yeah, so Trump wasn't good enough at defying the deep state. <laughs> at least he tried. Like, who else would have tried? Seriously, Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush? We would still be in Afghanistan. And the proxy war against Russia, that would have happened years earlier. Only Trump can say that he defied the same political system which was empowered by all those who came before him, many of whom we voted for in the first place, which is, of course, why they targeted him then, it's why they do now, and it's why they'll continue to do so indefinitely. There has been no other serious candidate to attempt, let alone succeed, at shattering the political establishment's orthodoxy on free trade and outsourcing, things that have hollowed out the country's manufacturing capacity, things that have destroyed the ability for normal Americans to get a well-paying job without having to go into severe debt. And then Trump comes along in his speech and he asks, when's the last time you saw a Chevrolet in Tokyo? What does that even mean? People like to forget that. People like to forget that every president on Mount Rushmore was a protectionist. People like to forget that every country that's ever built serious wealth has done so through protectionism. But that's beside the point since I guess people don't even really pretend to care about countries since they're globalists and whatnot openly, by the way. But he put up tariffs. He got us out of TPP. He renegotiated NAFTA. And yet the Trump economy, it's soaring. The experts said the opposite would happen. Very curious, isn't it, Cato Institute? You guys suck. And I peed on your building last time I was in D.C. But he, does, he did the same thing with the national security apparatus, right? Which, of course, literally maneuvered to keep him from office, then worked to remove him from office upon his election, like we discussed. He did this with foreign policy. He's the only president to not start a new military conflict in our lifetime. He actually worked to get us out of some. People like to forget that. Before Donald Trump, virtually no Republican would dare question the post 9-11 wars, not their motivations, not their outcomes, nothing, even though they were obviously disasters that achieved nothing for us. And then Trump gets on stage and he calls the product of their so-called expertise a big fat mistake. He tells Jeb Bush that the Twin Towers came down under his brother. I mean, you cannot even imagine the amount of people that were shitting their pants when he said that. I mean, you have to understand that when you run as a Republican, you're coached to never say anything even remotely like that because it will destroy your career. And you hear that and you think, oh, well, that's because it's unpopular. No, it's actually because doing so is a declaration of war upon the system, which will then try to destroy you. But Trump did it and it, he was right and it worked. Trump channeled that anger, the anger of millions of people in military families, all wondering exactly what we had received in return for our sacrifice. The Twin Towers came down under your brother. Or what about when Iran shot down that drone? People like Mike Pompeo, Mike Pence, John Bolton, who by the way, John Bolton obviously never met a war he didn't like. And all of these neo-never Trumpers who are now supporting DeSantis, they were celebrating when Trump hired John Bolton. And all these top advisors, these A-list figures in GOP politics, they all wanted to do a retaliatory strike. But Trump was like, eh, no, we'll do a little cyber attacking. We'll do a little sanctioning instead. Because, yeah, it turns out that, like, killing what would have been, I think, an estimated 150 people is not a proportionate response to a drone. And Trump had better sense than the supposed experts. But more importantly and uniquely, he was actually able to stand up to them, even on abortion. All of the highly educated legal scholars and consultants, they all tell these candidates, okay, you're not supposed to directly mention specific legal outcomes. Trump just goes out there and he just straight up says, I will be appointing pro-life judges who will overturn Roe v. Wade. And then he actually did it. That is so fucking funny. Like Donald John Trump is the catalyst that led to the end of Roe v. Wade. Can you imagine telling somebody in the 1980s, yeah, Donald Trump is gonna take care of this for you guys. Don't even worry. It'll be tremendous. You'll see many people are saying that this is also true. Like. That's the thing, you know, Trump made it so we didn't have to be neutral anymore. We didn't have to pretend that, oh, hey, we could be wrong. Trump did away with this whole myth of the neutral institutions. With all of these issues, immigration, foreign policy, transnational governance, the political establishment and the elites before Trump had simply decided. They had removed all of these fundamentally political questions from the realm of political discussion. It was just a consensus. There's no room for debate. There's not even need for debate because the experts had taken care of that for us already. So voters didn't matter. Literally, the only thing that mattered was the opinion of the expert class, which, of course, always coincidentally benefited them and their friends at the expense of the American people. And so all of these candidates we got to pick from, we could only like hesitantly and reluctantly pick from whichever of these candidates most sufficiently articulated how hard they believed in this idea of America, how much they love this idea of America. Trust me, everything's fine. The adults are in control. The point being that in almost all cases, Trump actually put first what was best for the American people instead of just ideological purity, meaning it was some nerd with a bunch of abstract theories who's never actually lived in the real world told him was best. Well, my principles, what about principles? It doesn't matter if you're principled, if your principles suck. Oh, well, at least I'm principled. No. You're a loser and you suck. That's your conviction. And you like want people to know that or something. 
The principles that these people boast about, by the way, they have destroyed the American dream. They have made our country dangerous. Our children are preyed upon. Our men are weak and impotent. Our women are depressed. That's the least of their problems. And what grand benefit of this whole system have we received that outweighs all of that, that would make it all worth it? The freedom to pursue anal sex, gluttony, genital mutilation, bestiality, deracination, pornography, drug addiction, heresy, narcissism. Like, who's winning right now? Satan. Yeah, like, like literally, that's the only beneficiary and those serving him. And those people don't let us speak the truth. How many dozens of times during those debates did Trump say something that we all know is true, but that nobody else would say, usually to the vocal disapproval of the audience of donors and special interest group representatives, etc. They would just start booing him and he would just roll his eyes and he would double down that it was true, which it actually was more often than not. That's why he's great. He's not an ideologue. He's just a normal American patriot. Like we've been saying, there is no Trumpism without Trump because there is no Trumpism. There is just Donald J. Trump. You can try to reduce it to an abstraction. You can try to quantify it, but you would be a fool because the value of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Trump has shifted the party attitudes in a way that has been very positive for the future of our country. He gave us the permission to say aloud what everybody's been thinking. But of course, usual suspects, the financial and ideological apparatuses of the right, the donors, the elites, the neocon establishment, legacy media, think tanks, etc. All of these people are still basically the same. And if anything, they've doubled down. They're bitter now. They're out for revenge. Those people who were booing him, they're still around. They're still working in politics. And they're probably very willing to use their influence and infrastructure to prop up a candidate to replace Trump, a candidate who may very well be well-meaning, but who will ultimately be used by very bad people to subvert the Trump revolution into something that's more friendly to the pre-Trump political establishment, because that really hasn't changed at all. And I mean, the elites in both parties are still very committed to terror policy like Ukraine, Taiwan, etc. Oh, well, Trump can't follow through. A partial disruption and general halting is better than efficient execution of like retardation, right? Like we agree with that. I'm not pretending that Trump could do everything that he said he wanted to do, uh, but he did face unified opposition, opposition from Democrats, from the leaders of his own party, from the intelligence agencies. I'm just over here asking why. Why was there a coordinated effort to prevent Trump from exercising the powers of the presidency from day one? With Russiagate, the two impeachment trials, now it's culminated in the investigation by the Department of Justice, et cetera, et cetera. You can think what you want about that, but it's undeniable that he has been targeted Targeted, not simply because he's a criminal bad guy, but because he threatens powerful interests in the world and in our country. But people want to deny this. So they'll hope for Trumpism without Trump. They like the agenda, but they think, well, Trump is too problematic. So if for whatever reason the deep state is determined to keep Trump away from the White House, well, then our best course of action is just to nominate someone uh, who can actually get things done. Like all this stuff, it makes sense on paper. It really does. But this is a fundamental misunderstanding of the essence of politics. It's not just about good policy and bad policy. It is a struggle for power between opposing forces. If someone isn't being seriously prevented from accessing power that we all know is controlled by very bad people, then it must be that they don't actually believe that that person would use that power against them or their interests. So while I understand the frustration with the first Trump administration, and trust me, I do more than anybody, you might even remember that I was meticulously critiquing it as it went on. It's truly just ridiculous, this whole write off Trump because he didn't do anything. Trump received more pushback than any figure in American political history. And he wasn't dependent on donor money or special, uh, special interest money, lobbyists. For all intents and purposes, he was not a part of the political system. And people think that a guy who doesn't check all those boxes or even any of them is going to handle the pressure from the system better. And even it's a false dichotomy because that guy would never get that pressure because for all intents and purposes, he is a part of that system and therefore it's not threatened by him. A point I should have made here on the allegation that Trump didn't do anything. When people on the right say that, both those who support Trump and those who don't, we still bear in mind that Trump sustained a tremendous economy, cut immigration in half, pulled us out of military conflicts and uniquely didn't start any new ones renegotiated trade deals to be advantageous to us, and more. So what do we mean when we lament, or lambaste, that Trump didn't get anything done? It is contextual to what we understand Trump to be, which as we discuss here at length is essentially a threat to our current political establishment. Therefore the reason people claim that he didn't get anything done is because what he was talking about was so aspiring insofar as it was challenging the entire structure and consensus of our political system, how it works. That's what people expected of him which is their frustration and their vague reminders of what he didn't get done. That is understandable. It becomes ridiculous when they, through the help of con incorporated astroturfing, begin to suggest that just plugging in somebody who gets things done at the state level, 
things that would be the equivalent of what Trump did get done in office, more or less just keeping the trains running on time, as if that's the solution to actually challenge our political system and change things for the better. Citing the accomplishments of alternatives to Trump as comically misguided, their project was never as ambitious. In order to actually challenge the system, you would need somebody who could survive all of its attempts to destroy them. Media blackout, doesn't matter. Household name. Elites and mega corporations won't donate to the campaign, doesn't matter. He's got his own money. He's self-funded. Like, you would literally need somebody who is good on the issues, doesn't give a damn about what anybody thinks about them, is crazy enough to believe that he could actually pull it off, despite all the opposition they're doing to him that it's actually worth it for him to keep going. They've got the money to fund the whole thing themselves if they have to. They're already famous. They're hilarious. They're cool. You would need Donald Trump, basically. So if it's not him, tell me who else checks all those boxes and I'll jump ship, I guess. But there's no one else. Trump is a once in a lifetime political figure. Like you're never gonna see something like this for the rest of your life again. And you'll notice that nobody who's a part of the system is willing to say that because they ultimately either benefit from it or they still have faith in it or both. But like you need somebody who's gonna go in there and just torch the whole thing. And the man for that job is Donald Trump because the key point is that you can be within the system without being a piece of the system. Like Trump existed within it, but DeSantis by all metrics is cut from the same cloth as the system. And we will explain and discuss the implications of this as we continue, but Trump is talking about fundamentally restructuring the federal government akin to FDR, akin to Lincoln. That is beautiful. Apparently he hasn't even spoken to Kushner seriously since everything that went down in 2020. And he knows he can only serve two terms. He only probably wants to. I mean, King Trump, that's a meme. Which means that he knows if he were ever to go scorched earth mode and get his revenge, it would be in his second term. And I mean, if he doesn't, what does that even look like? Okay, DeSantis stays in Florida, continues to set an example for what governing a red state should look like. Maybe he does an even better job. He gets Florida more aggrandized, gets the base more aggrandized, builds up his war chest for 2028, wins the presidency. I have no real problem with that. I want him to succeed. I want him to make Florida even redder. I want him to make America even redder if he's really the man for the job. But why would he want to get into bed with the GOP establishment to try to steal the torch from Donald Trump? Are we really supposed to believe that's an improvement? That the most powerful people in the country are fools? We're smarter than them because we know that they're just opening the gates and letting in the Trojan horse that is Ron DeSantis, the true threat to the system. But would Trump in office for another four years, even assuming he doesn't do anything, which I think is unrealistic, I think that almost all of the things that were causing him to be less effective than we would have liked in terms of his ability to operate without being like distracted or dissuaded uh, by his constituents, all of those have more or less been corrected, at least that I'm aware of. I've actually, I've heard from people who would know. So, you know, people can just say, oh, it's going to be a repeat of the first administration. The variables that caused that have largely been removed, which maybe isn't a perfect indicator, but it's not insignificant. But even then, what did the Trump presidency do? Its greatest accomplishment was exposing the rot within our system and within our country. At every level, it exposed the bitterness and the viciousness of about a third of the country. It exposed the sheer level of dishonesty and corruption within the media, within the bureaucracy, academia, the government, like everywhere. And yeah, you know, maybe people knew about that 10, 15, 50 years ago. Now it is unquestionable. It's never been more obvious. This vampire is now screeching and it's because the man with the golden mane pulled back the curtain and now sunlight is beaming off of its skin. And you know what else? It was also extraordinarily entertaining. It brought us hope. We really believed that the best days were ahead. You could feel the optimism. And people take this energy for granted. They think that it can still exist without Donald Trump. It can't. Oh, if we could only channel this energy into our based populist candidate who gets things done, that's just not how it works. But that's what the conservative establishment is going to try to do. Mark my words, after midterms, when they don't immediately need Trump's name for fundraising, they're going to try to officially start to move people away from Donald Trump, who's too problematic, and support a serious candidate like Ron DeSantis. All the better if Trump gets indicted after midterms. Do you understand how many of our voters will just give up on the system if it betrays Donald Trump? That's why the electability, that whole argument is so ridiculous. He who is most electable is he who will get the most votes by definition. And there's no question as to who that is. What you mean to say is that you want your little respectability politics back, but we're not gonna allow that. When Donald Trump mogs Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi in front of news cameras, is that respectable politics? Only Donald Trump could ever and would ever do something like that. And he did it daily. But I could tell you otherwise, I really could. I mean, that's where the money is right now. That's where the grift is. There's a ton of money to be made in selling people false hope, selling them snake oil during the managed decline of our country. I could sell you that. I mean, I could, I could sell you this new idea, this new thing, new strategy to save America. That's what people like to hear. It's fresh, it makes them feel good, it's exciting, it's new. But that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to tell you, look, 
Donald Trump, for all of his faults, is still by far the best shot that we have right now. That's just the truth. And again, you can't refute anything that we've said so far. You might not like it. It probably annoys you, but it's true. And yeah, there's a lot of Trump grifters left over, but most of them have moved on to Ron DeSantis, these other characters. But you'll notice they never even really understood what he ran on in 2016. Oftentimes they even undermine it. I've been on the Trump train for seven years and you know if you've been on as well, it costs you a lot. It costs you relationships, it costs you money, it can cost you your reputation. But the answer to that isn't to cower and go towards something less problematic because that just reinforces and justifies the persecution in the first place. It tells them, hey, it works when you do that. And that's typically what we're seeing nowadays. You know, you've got these people who just absolutely hate Trump. They absolutely love DeSantis. And usually that just is a proxy for, I want my liberal friends to tolerate me still. Like, come on guys, at least it's not Trump. That's what Biden means when he says mainstream Republican, by the way. You know, when he gave that speech declaring war on Trump supporters, it's like we talked about in the What Happens If Trump Loses video. They want to tell you, oh no, we don't have a problem with Republicans. It's just Trump. It's just Trump. He's bad. Yeah, of course they don't have a problem with the Republican establishment. They keep the trains of war, mass immigration, deracination, all that, they keep that running on time. And I urge you to understand that just because DeSantis is occasionally bullied by left-wing publications does not make his persecution or fortitude comparable to the complete coordinated, which we have proof of, by the way, the coordination, it doesn't make him comparable to the type of media and legal blitzkrieg against Trump. Like the migrant busing stunt, that was a great photo op, very clever. Now they're on a pathway to citizenship because remember the second they threatened to bring down a little heat on him, he quit doing it. That's what Trumpism without Trump would look like. The establishment GOP wants so badly to shoehorn Trumpism into these abstractions and categories that are ultimately non-threatening and which are contained within the paradigm, even if on the edge of it. It's still ultimately, even if less obviously, towing the line. It doesn't really matter if it was like with less patience given to journalists while it did so. People aren't gonna get off the couch and vote because of a big tech bill that frankly didn't even do anything. They're not gonna do it because they're excited by based populist antitrust legislation. These people are not ideologues. They're normal Americans. It's not my blue collar workers. It's not the evangelicals or the religious right. It's none of these categories. It's simply normal Americans. Trump didn't win because he was a populist. He won because he said he was gonna kick out illegal aliens and then make their family members pay for a wall. It's not that his rhetoric and messaging was like edgy or unpolished or blue collar or whatever. It's that it was fundamentally anti-establishment, even just in that it was politically incorrect. Not even that necessary. It was like real. It wasn't curated. It didn't have to go through the focus group testing. It didn't have to be telephoned through the bureaucracy, through the class of credentialed experts or whatever. It was literally just one guy with a few bullet points on a note card for two hours. It fundamentally challenged everything that the establishment is built upon and everything that they've tried so hard to get the American people to believe in. It was fundamentally anti-feminist. It was anti-equality, anti-diversity, anti-globalism, anti-egalitarian. Most importantly, it was funny. It was fun. And that's all to say it was real. It was American. Donald Trump didn't look at this uptight college girl when she tried to corner him on the wage gap and cite data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics about how, um, actually, when you account for hours worked and experience, uh, the gap disappears. He just said, you're going to make the same if you do as good a job. He literally implied that it's because women don't work as well as men. That is hilarious. No one else has the balls to say that. What did Trump say when Megyn Kelly brought up his comments about women? As if that matters, by the way. Literally as if that has any implication on anything ever. He doubles down, only Rosie O'Donnell, and the people loved it. The next day, he goes on television to basically accuse her of being in a bad mood because she was on her period. It does not get more transgressive than that. Think about that. There is unironically not a series of comments that he could have made that would have been more antithetical to everything that the establishment believes and everything that they want to get you to believe, which they've tried so hard to get you to. I don't like his tone. Literally, who cares about tone? Women and effeminate men. For every one person who doesn't like his tone, there's a dozen new voters who like him precisely because of his tone. And the worst thing they had on this guy was that he stated the fact that women will let rich and powerful men touch them. That was their big reveal. That was their October surprise. Like, what, are we supposed to believe that these other people are perfect? Probably not. So the question becomes, why isn't the establishment media targeting them? Because they're controlled opposition. They play the role of the opposition. And maybe they're doing so with the best of intentions. But ultimately, the people who pull the strings know that they don't actually pose a legitimate threat. And those who don't understand this, like at this point, you're just out of touch. I mean, they still believe in our political establishment, which is to say that they believe that everything that has happened to our country in the last 60 years, everything that has destroyed it, it's basically been justified. And even if that's not the case, even if they don't believe that, they still just want to vote in like another career politician. They want to just roll the dice with a new guy. 
These people, I don't want to call anybody out. Look, I'm a businessman, okay? My job is to get along with people, okay? I get along with everybody. So we'll just make up a name. Uh, okay, so we'll call this guy Ben Shapiro. So this Ben Shapiro guy has a viral clip where somebody asks him at a Q&A about who Republicans should run in 2024. And he's got this great UCLA poli-sci explanation about the cycle of elections being a referendum on this political candidate or this political candidate. And it's like, no, dude, it's a referendum on the whole political establishment, the entire thing. And until that changes, that's all it's ever going to be, bottom line. And I actually, I think Shapiro's better on the issues than he gets credit for, especially with young people. Young people People really like to criticize him as a way to kind of signal their political development since a lot of people started out with him, but he's still right on a lot of issues, you know, but when he's wrong, he's, uh, <laughs> oh, he's, he's pretty off the mark. Uh, one second, please. Product time. Look, you know how much I love iTarget, and if you have one, I'm about to take you to the next level. If not, new product. It's something you gotta get. Have you ever seen competitive shooters practice timing drills on the range? Imagine being able to do that at home, anytime you want, and never having to spend a dime on ammo. That's what the all-new iTarget Cube does. The iTarget Cube is fully compatible with your existing laser bullets. You can buy one, upgrade to the three-pack for a truly unique training experience, compete with friends, practice clearing drills, or use random mode to test your ability to react, all while the system times every shot you take. Right now, save 10% plus get free shipping with the offer code DOYLE when you go to itargetpro.com. iTarget comes in most calibers from 9mm to 223, so you can train with almost any firearm. This is the easiest and the most cost-effective way to train, and it pays for itself in a single day. That's the letter itargetpro.com, itargetpro.com, offer code DOYLE, very epic, we continue. So, Fast forward to the open and unapologetic declaration of war on normal Americans. Biden goes to Philadelphia, delivers remarks on the soul of the nation from Independence Hall. And despite the fact that the GOP wants to obfuscate what the purpose of this speech was, which we'll get into, it is like, it's like unambiguous. <laughs> it's like so clear throughout the entire speech, the messaging, the aesthetics. The speech was nothing short of a declaration of war against normal Americans, uh, who he referred to in this address as an enemy horde. So if you voted for Donald Trump, you are an enemy horde member. And you know, we've been talking about this here. We talked about this two years ago. This is the attempt to feign bipartisanship, to emphasize that the orange man, he really just was that bad by extending an olive branch from the Democrat establishment to the establishment Republicans, literally two sides of the same coin, to say, look, obviously we have disagreements, but we're all Americans, damn it. And if we can just agree that those other people are the problem, then we can get back to business. And of course, they want to get back to business because that means no serious change will ever actually occur. That's also why he repeats in this speech that America's just an idea, man. Come on, it's an idea. America's an idea. This is fundamentally no different than what the GOP establishment and the neocons believe, that America is just this idea and nothing else. And the harder you just believe in this idea that is America, the more American you are. And the only difference between the two parties is that Democrats believe that being an American means being gay and like worshiping minorities. And Republicans believe that being an American is just being able to make money. Who's more American? I want an answer from Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell. Who is more American? a gay white guy who moved here like five years ago from England or something, or a Somali who was born in Minneapolis, speaks zero English, but has like a locally popular hot dog stand. Which one is more American? I'm a one issue voter. This is my wedge issue, okay? We the people demand answers. And you know, they would actually, <laughs> they would probably both agree that the hot dog stand is the, the more American guy. Hell yeah, brother. Hey, long as them headscarves come in American flag print, I ain't got no problem, shoot. I might even get my daughter one. The point being that like we mentioned, you know, this is actually the same messaging that was being articulated by the GOP front runners in 2016. It's all the same status quo. And that's why they have to ostracize and demonize Trump and his base because that's the only force that actually has serious potential uh, to change things for the better in this country. And it's not just because they're voters for the opposite party. No, that's what the GOP is telling you that this speech meant, but it's specifically and only Trump voters because they've actually demonstrated that they're not buying anymore what the GOP is trying to sell to them. They want actual and legitimate change in this country. And it starts by rejecting the whole political establishment. And believe me, they reject it wholeheartedly. But remember, if you hold these ideas, you're a Nazi. That's why Biden brought up Charlottesville. He, he said when he saw Charlottesville, that's when he knew he had to run. Like, what does that even mean? What does it mean when you look at an event as insignificant as Charlottesville and decide that that's like the basis for your entire campaign? It means that if you're a normal white American who cares about your country and cares about your heritage, you are for all intents and purposes a Nazi. Like, you're the problem. You're the threat to democracy. You're an extremist. Whatever. Extremist literally just means that you're on the extreme of the bell curve distribution of American political thought. And at this point, 
why would you not? Like, how could you not be an extremist? Because otherwise you're in the middle, which means you're clearly not intelligent enough to detect that there's something seriously wrong in this country. Moreover, that is defined in practice as holding the average opinions of a man in this country like 50 years ago. So it doesn't even mean anything. Your literal party platform is mutilating the genitals of children. That's what you're about. Like no prominent member of your party will disavow that. Oh, extremists, yeah, you're damn right. But that's why they like the mainstream Republicans, the non-threatening Republicans, the stiff ones with the lifeless eyes, the low energy. Guess what? Guess what? Fact check. Uh, MAGA Republicans are the mainstream Republicans. There are tens of millions of us. We're not going anywhere. We're smarter than you. We have more energy. We're better looking than you, which is to say that children don't wince when they see us in public, which honestly is it's becoming something of a delicacy in American politics. Thanks to you, you dysgenic, depraved freaks. You people think that you're like made from the stock of revolutionaries of days past. You can't even make eye contact with, with a barista when you're ordering a coffee. You're not inspired. You're united by nothing except shared misery. So yeah, we'll be the problem, children. We're the problem in America because we don't want to stop what's happening. We actually want to completely change the course. They're actually correct that we can't exist in this country anymore, this country, because we can't. Eventually, conditions will become too disordered and unsustainable. We've never been so far left as a country before, yet the left is more miserable and hateful than ever. And eventually, the right will develop the moral courage to stop these people. I really believe so, because what else would we do? What is the soul of the nation in practice? Like violent crime, the silencing of dissent, the inescapable promotion of ugliness, the destruction of beauty, the celebration of anal sex and genital mutilation, the incessant demonization of white people, the literal worship of non-white people. Think about that. Think about how in like a Catholic monarchy, there would be no decision made at the institutional level, which did not first ask, well, how would God feel about this? We do the same thing here, except it's like, okay, well, how would black people feel about this? Should we keep going? A war on everything natural, on the creation of families, on motherhood, on femininity, on masculinity, on God, on God, of course, any declaration of right and wrong that transcends the current state of our national moral compass, which is just tolerance towards degeneracy. We could keep going, but the present soul of this country is disgusting. It is is unnatural, it is abominable, it's dysgenic, it's doughy, it's mentally unwell, it's, it's neurotic, it's chaotic, it's destructive to the human spirit, to our actual souls. And keep in mind, all of these things are not defects. They're not bugs. These are all features of the machine. Each of these things cannot be compromised on by these people. They are all pillars that support this system. They are a part of its foundations. They are all intrinsically componential to it. So when they say that we're a threat to the soul of the country, sure, yeah, the same way that water is a threat to fire or chemotherapy is a threat to cancer, chlorine is a threat to bacteria. Like there's nothing you can do to stop it, by the way. We're too far into it. It's the dark Brandon speech, which is just pathetic. It's the show trials, it's the censorship, it's all of it. You know what's waiting for you down the line and you can try to stop it or delay it, but that's just gonna make it more satisfying for us when we beat you. So yeah, uh, we are actually going to restore the proper soul of this nation and you'll be better off for it. It's a thankless job, truly. Like we always say, we're gonna make America great again for you too, don't even worry about it. And that's the point of optimism in this speech by Biden. It reveals how fragile their power really is. You've got a very weak, pitiful man attempting to portray strength through visuals. His staff thought this would be so cool. The red lighting, the, the Marines. Yeah, let's own the maggots. But at the end of the day, you've got the most establishment political figure in the country, Joe Biden. He's been around for 50 years. He's completely senile now, but that's your guy. That's the guy that you people are propping up. How pathetic. Imagine the conversations within the administration, all the inside jokes. Imagine the other world leaders that partake in mocking you people and you know the whole staff and when they're talking with their staffers, and whatever. This is the culmination. Like this is the ultimate form of American liberalism. How out of touch are you people? How terrified are you people? What an ugly thing you've done. What a crime against aesthetics to try to portray this confused, decrepit old man as some sort of strong man so that you could all masturbate to your self-perceived power. You called Trump standing on a balcony a Mussolini moment because you realized it was like incidentally cool and portrayed strength, which you felt threatened by until you compared it to fascism. But then you try to mimic that with dark Brandon, but you fail because you cannot make shilling for the establishment cool or edgy. Like, oh yeah, dark Brandon's gonna let gay couples adopt children. Listen here, Jack, here's the deal. Look, your son's gonna chop his dick off. And if you disagree, you ain't American. That's real freedom, man. Come on, God bless it. <laughs> so based, dark Brandon epic, upvotes. But even that aside, like how pathetic it was, we still have to consider the implications of it. Because the last time a speech like that was given, a real fire and brimstone speech, that was with George Bush when he was like targeting Saddam Hussein in Iraq or whatever, maybe even Reagan with the evil empire. But this time, Joe Biden is targeting domestic opposition to the incumbent regime, which is between 70 and 80 million Trump voters. 
And there was so much thought that went into this speech, into the visuals of it. I mean, literally everything that you are seeing and hearing was meticulously decided by people. And so why? Uh, well, it's the same reason that Bush gave the speech. It's to prepare the public for war. It's to prime them for it. Except this time, as referenced by other prominent members in the Democratic Party, these enemies are domestic. And they are enemies insofar as they actually threaten the power of the incumbent regime, or at least intend to do so. That's why he specifically targets the MAGA Republicans. That's why he uses the language clear and present danger. That's why he's bringing up the horrific violence of the insurrection. All these lies, he's basically giving the green light to the national security apparatus and to federal law enforcement to like go ahead and crack down on all serious dissent. And this was only a month after the FBI raided Mar-a-Lago, which again, totally unprecedented. They didn't even raid Nixon. They didn't even charge him either. Not that he did anything wrong, because he didn't, but he didn't do anything wrong less than Trump, probably. And you're talking about institutions which have been caught illegally spying on the campaign, spying on citizens, fabricating evidence against these people, et cetera, et cetera. And now they're being encouraged, sometimes even like against their will, to persecute the political enemies of the regime. And they're hoping that Trump gets charged and is removed from the running and or it's just too much for the already weak GOP leadership class to handle. And so they just abandon Trump, they move on to somebody who's less problematic or whatever. And what's maybe even more alarming is that they are so ready, like their mouths are watering at the idea of taking any outrage from Trump's base and pushback from Trump's political allies and making examples of those people. Mobilizing the National Guard, moving forward with the domestic war on terror, putting these people in prison, using these obscure legal measures in order to target Trump's allies within the government, putting these people in handcuffs on television. That's what they want. They want the image of whatever advocacy normal American patriots think they have left. They want the image of that person or those people in handcuffs on your television in your living room. That's what they want. They want that person humiliated and they want to demoralize you. They want to put your president in handcuffs on national television and they're going to commercialize it. They're going to sell merchandise of it and make hilarious little quips about it on late night television. And then they want to no knock raid your house if they catch you getting a little bit too angry about it in a private message to a friend, which of course they'll be monitoring. But this is what democracy looks like, right? This is what democracy looks like. It's the cycle of tyranny. This is what always happens. And if you'd agree that we're living under a tyranny, then you should naturally expect any serious opposition to that tyranny need to be persecuted to this extent. And that's why the GOP wants to distract you, you know? They need you to think that they actually represent you. So they get on television and they say, that Brandon speech was rich, wasn't it? Yeah, we're so threatening, give us money, vote for us. We're gonna get him this time. And then, well, one of these people is epically grilling somebody with tough questions in a congressional hearing. You're gonna have the Brandon Stasi like encircling Trump Tower, they're blocking off Fifth Avenue. It's like the Breaking Bad ending, you know? It's just Trump alone in his office. He's looking at the CCTV feed on the monitors. They're all rushing up the golden escalator. Bad finger starts playing. He's just slowly pacing around his office. Runs his hand across Tom Brady's Super Bowl helmet, Mike Tyson's boxing gloves, the Diet Coke button. He just picks up a red MAGA hat, you know, just looking at it. But we don't even see Trump directly in this shot, only slightly, only through reflection. His image is being reflected off the glass of a framed photograph of when he was meeting Kim Jong-un. And then he just collapses right to the ground, like right then and there. And we get the bird's eye shot, right? Because all the decades of Big Macs promoting the jab, you know, the big guy just collapses right there. God forbid that happen. I'm, I shouldn't even joke about that, seriously. No, you know what happens? He hits the Diet Coke button. And then these cans of Diet Coke, they're, they're swinging down and they're giving a bunch of black eyes to the brand and secret police. It's like in Home Alone. Remember when they took out Trump's cameo in Home Alone 2? Talk about Orwell rolling in his grave right now. Yeah, Trump's on the balcony, he's overlooking them. Have you guys had enough or are you thirsty for more? Just Diet Coke cans just raining down. Trump makes his escape <laughs> through a secret elevator without detection. Remember, he's a nimble navigator, but then he gets cornered, right? They've, they've got a gun, shoot him. Shoot him, I'm trying to shoot him, but they can't because the revolver, it's, it's covered in melted Trump ice cream from a previous trap. So the gun, it won't fire. He's scrambling to pull back the hammer. And then look who it is. Just when all hope was lost, it's one of the Central Park Five. Trump, run. He just throws a bunch of cocaine on the police, just blankets them in cocaine, which he had on him because he's probably still a criminal. But it's okay now because Trump realizes now that this guy who he thought was his enemy, who he spoke so unfavorably of so many years ago, is actually his friend. And he helped him. And then all these homeless people, all these tweakers and crackheads, they just mob the police. They just absolutely crawl all over these people. 
They're screaming, you know, and then Trump and the Central Park rapist, they exchange one last look before Trump runs off and he makes his escape. Sort of an interesting ending there. Not really sure what John Hughes was trying to say with that. But anyways, that's why the GOP, who wasn't even named in this speech, in fact, they were even defended in this speech, that's why they have to pretend that it was about them because that's how they distract you and manipulate you into giving them more money and power to do absolutely nothing to actually represent you or your interests because it's not about what benefits you, it's about what benefits them, which in this case is just wearing the uniform of the opposition like it's a costume or something because that comes with all the benefits of being in the opposition the perceived nobility the money the support but without the costs that come with being in the opposition namely the total and unrelenting persecution but like we said trump will never quit his supporters will never quit so it's not enough to have persecution you have to have subversion you have to take them down from within you need a pressure release valve you need someone like Ron DeSantis, who again, I'm not saying there's like this grand coordinated conspiracy that he's in on, but it's simply a matter of fact that all of the leftover interests and forces within the Republican Party see that opportunity in DeSantis, whether he intends for that to happen or not. And the Democrats are fundamentally not threatened by him as a political figure, which we're about to get into. But first, I think it's important to look at the response that he gave to Joe Biden's declaration of war against American patriots, because look, I'm just a guy asking questions, okay? I'm asking questions. That's all I'm doing. That's my job. Questions like, why is Ron DeSantis still allowed on social media, but Donald Trump isn't? Why is Ron DeSantis able to go on Fox whenever he wants, but Donald Trump isn't? Why did DeSantis choose to respond without acknowledging that this was a direct attack on Donald Trump? Because when he does this segment, he frames it like it's an attack on half the country, which I guess is true, but that implies that it was just Republican voters or people who vote for Republicans. That's what that means when politicians say half the country. You know, we hear this a million times a year because if it's just a partisan attack, you know, on Republican voters, well, then it's just politics as usual. Then it's no different from what we've been seeing for the last 50 years. It's just politics as usual. It's Democrats and Republicans, whatever. And then DeSantis goes on to say that it's an attack on people who disapprove of Joe Biden, people who dissent from his policy. That's an interesting way to say it because Joe Biden was actually more precise with it. He said it's an attack on MAGA Republicans who are a clear and present danger to our democracy. Therefore, we need a domestic war on terror like Bush's equivalent speech, prime people for the foreign war on terror. Mitch McConnell disagrees with Joe Biden's policies and he dissents. So does David French and Jonah Goldberg. So do the libertarians. But was that speech about them, people who just generally disagree with his policies? No, it was unambiguously about Trump and his supporters. But here it's framed as attacking Republicans who don't want him to get his way. It's a partisan attack on half the country. No, it wasn't partisan. It was ideological. And there is a difference because you can disagree with Joe Biden and also not support Donald Trump. Like this is the position of virtually all neocons. So my question as a guy who asks questions is why in this nearly 10 minute segment did Ron DeSantis not once say Donald Trump's name? Why did he not once say MAGA? Why is he framing it this way? This is the literal attempted erasure of Donald Trump and MAGA from Republican politics. There's no other way to put it. Joe Biden was so clear in his speech about who he was talking about and the message that he was sending, but Republicans ignore it. And they just wanna go back to the standard talking points because the secret that they don't yet feel empowered enough to say aloud is that they actually agree. They actually want Trump gone too. That's why in this segment, they just kept pivoting back to what would be considered DeSantis's resume, you know, blaming Democrats for inflation, lockdowns, rising prices, et cetera. But Biden didn't mention any of those issues in his speech, not a single one. And to that, you might say, well, obviously Biden's speech was just political theater and we should focus on what really matters, which are issues such as those. Really? Why? Why not respond to the speech directly? Things have actually been this bad before, materially speaking. Like we've seen inflation before. We've had lockdowns thanks to governors from both parties for years now. So why not respond to what's new? Why not respond to the first time in the history of our country where we have a sitting president do nothing less than declare war on the tens of millions of Americans who supported and still do support Donald Trump? Isn't that worth mentioning? But if you frame it by focusing on the issues, well, then it's just politics as usual, right? You ignore the fact that our current system is designed to create these issues and have the American people foot the bill while you have these people play ping pong about who's to blame. You ignore the questions of legitimacy that are being asked of that system and you get back to the politics as usual, to the, well, President Brandon's trying to distract from how he's gonna get his butt kicked when we vote all our guys in office. <laughs> and then they can do what exactly? What are they gonna do when they get voted in? with money raised off Donald Trump's name, which you won't even say, nothing, so that they can do nothing. Joe Biden delivering a speech that amounts to a declaration of war against any threat to the political establishment, and then Ron DeSantis gets on there and wants to talk about inflation and lockdowns. Important issues, yes.
But the bottom line is that until you fundamentally restructure the system that we currently have in this country, you're never going to escape those issues. And in fact, you're going to be dealing with a lot worse than those issues. You might be able to slow it down for a couple years, but you will never be able to stop it completely, let alone reverse it. And for some reason, DeSantis is being propped up by all of the people who are of that cloth, of the cloth of the weak leadership, of the cloth of those who sold us out. Does that mean that DeSantis is one of them? Not necessarily, and I really hope not, but frankly, it remains to be seen. The point being that in the meantime, he's being propped up by all of these people who want to return to politics as usual because they still naively have a general faith in the system and or they're making a lot of money through it, even though the rest of us are suffering and our country is being destroyed. Oh, well, just imagine... Listen to that speech, but replace MAGA Republicans with black people or Jews or women or even Democrats. How awful. Okay, yeah, but you don't even have to do that. The speech was written to convey that already, except MAGA Republican is just a proxy for normal white people. Those are the people being persecuted and disenfranchised by the system that neocons put so much faith into. Whereas Trump is the only candidate who actually says he's going to fire 50,000 federal employees if he's elected. That's the deep state. These other characters will just leave them intact for the next Democrat administration to use twice as hard against us. That's what always happens, right? Because the last hundred years of right-wing politics in America can be fairly well summarized by refusing to stand by people because we're afraid of what the left says, and then we wonder why we've lost our country. Maybe because the establishment only seriously targets those who it perceives to be a significant threat. But then we throw those people to the wolves when we see what that targeting actually looks like in practice. That, that's why it's not about the MAGA Republicans just opposing his political agenda, but specifically and very specifically being in support of a particular agenda. The only one that actually threatens the status quo, you know, you, you, you political agenda. Yeah, well, maybe if you were comfortable with the idea of politicizing things like 50 years ago, now we wouldn't have to be arguing about why children shouldn't have their genitals mutilated. Think about that. You eat food now. You digest that food. You convert it into calories, which are now spent on that, on constructing arguments why this shouldn't be happening to children. That's what the right wing establishment in this country has done for you. Oh, well. But DeSantis is more electable. This is not true in the very literal sense of the term. DeSantis is not, all things considered, more likely to win an election than Donald Trump. That's just plainly not true. What you're trying to say is that DeSantis is less problematic than Trump. He has less baggage than Trump, etc. And you mistakenly think that this translates to a higher likelihood of electoral success, but this just isn't the case. And it's also a fundamental misread of our current political climate. And again, I'm not criticizing DeSantis. I'm really not. I'm sure it sounds that way, but rather I'm just attacking this image of him that people are astroturfing and spreading around because that's the image that they're going to try to use and are trying to use to discredit and take down Trump. That's really the most offensive part to me. They're trying to market DeSantis as something he's not, which is just unnatural. It's disordered. It literally evokes the same response to me as when I see a transgender person. Like, there's just something not right going on because it'd be one thing if they were marketing like this guy who could actually be the Trumpism without Trump that they want so badly, but they're not. They're like lying and manufacturing this image of based Ron DeSantis and it's like not even the same thing. And they're too arrogant and stupid to understand that the whole idea is being pushed in the first place by very nefarious forces in society who are threatened by Donald Trump, who hate Donald Trump and who want to take him out. And so they're using these useful idiots to do so. Okay, that's it. We've dipped our toes in too many times. Let's just do it. DeSantis versus Trump. Let's talk about it. Conversation is awesome. We're asking questions. And this is going to be tough love, but it's necessary, okay? I'm commanded to speak the truth. I have to warn you. This is my midnight ride against the neocon establishment. Here's the bottom line. There is absolutely no good reason to run DeSantis instead of Donald Trump in 2024. There is no indication that he would be more popular and therefore more electable. There is no indication that he would get more done in office than Trump. And there is no indication that he's as good on the issues as Trump. There is, however, every indication that he is being propped up by the establishment GOP as the alternative to Trump, as Trump without the baggage, which is being done because these people just want to return to business as usual. The DeSantis fans might not recognize this. DeSantis himself might not recognize this, but it's obviously the case. It is so obviously the case. He's a great governor, but it's really easy to have that title when 90% of the GOP governors are totally incompetent. The idea that he can even hold a candle to everything that Donald Trump has done for the advancement of actually conservative policies and attitudes in this country is is misaligned with reality, let alone that he deserves the nomination in 2024 by stealing the torch from Donald Trump, who lit it in the first place. And again, I like Ron DeSantis, but nothing that I've said about him so far or that we'll get into here is incorrect. It's all true. So it's now incumbent upon you to explain why the fact that he's supported by every neocon from David French to Paul Ryan is actually based and a threat to the system. Like that's your job to explain, along with the other hundred red flags that we'll talk about, which again are literally just factual. If you want DeSantis in 2024, 
then you have to explain away these things and why they're not actually problematic. So anyways, the first thing we have to address is all the silly arguments against Trump. These are things that people just throw out as if they even matter, usually said hysterically, such as, oh, he's old. Yeah, who even cares? There's nothing that would tell us that except you screaming about his age. Like he's high energy, he's sharp as attack, and more importantly, the people that he attracts that would staff his administration, that's the most important part. Even assuming he becomes like senile or something, like these are the most intelligent right-wing people in the country, authentically right-wing people in the country. And they all want Donald Trump. Alternatives to this are just gonna be staffed by these like wannabe populist types who just ultimately don't get it. Um, but anyways, the first real one is this idea that Trump is off-putting to the suburbs. I don't think this is true, especially given our current political situation where we're at such a state of turmoil, like we've said, you've got like deliberate targeting of children. At this point, people just want somebody who's gonna strike fear into the hearts of all the people who have done this to them and just basically tell them like to F off. Also, what's never acknowledged for some reason is that being palatable to the base doesn't necessarily inspire people who have never voted before or people who have lost faith in the system to go get out and vote, which is something that Trump is uniquely able to do. And adjacent to this is this whole like, oh, well, Trump has too much baggage. Again, everyone has baggage. It is just a matter of who the media and who the establishment decides to target and who they don't. Moreover, literally what baggage? It's all just media hysteria. And you know that, you do. Whether you wanna make the conscious decision to bend the knee to that media hysteria because you think it will benefit you in the long run, that's another question. But ultimately that's all it is. Uh, but that said, there is one criticism that I actually agree with, but I don't think it disqualifies him. That's the promotion of the jab. Look, I'm much more of a pragmatist than I am a purist. I'm much more worried by exceptionally bad behavior, behavior that was so bad that it stood out from the average. And you have to remember that literally everybody was promoting this with a handful of exceptions, but everybody in the mainstream was promoting this, even Ron DeSantis. And it reminds me of when leftists are like, oh, you know, the founding fathers, they own slaves. And it's like, yeah, that was normal back then. But you know, to be clear, I'm not excusing this. I think it was wrong. I think it was bad. I'm not excusing it. I'm just disarming it a little bit because to be fair, everybody in the mainstream promoted this at some point. So where's the line drawn? Like how much worse is this person for promoting it for X amount of days more than this other person? Moreover, who else do we have here? Show me someone who didn't promote it and who is ready and capable to be at the level of Donald Trump right now. Like we just don't have those options. Also, frankly, Nobody went to go get it because Trump told them to. Like He was getting booed at his rallies, rightfully so, for talking about this. So as long as you trusted your instincts, you'll be fine. Uh, so anyways, the last one is actually the one that annoys me the most out of all of them because quite honestly, people sound like spoiled brats when they say this. This is the, well, Trump didn't get anything done. <laughs> Trump didn't do anything. <laughs> it's really easy to sit here and criticize Trump for not better handling onslaught, which has never been seen before in the history of our country, and which was precisely brought about to stop him. Like, people are just spoiled. People like to forget that before Donald Trump, people like Jeb Bush were governing Florida. This is what Florida politics looked like before Donald Trump. This is what right-wing politics looked like before Donald Trump. People like to forget that before Donald Trump announced his candidacy, Jeb Bush was universally predicted to be the GOP nominee. It was universally understood that we were going to get to continue the post-war paradigm of American politics through the illusion of choice that was, well, hey, at least we get to decide between another Clinton and another Bush. Like, this is just the, the, the way things were. The things people complain about Trump not doing, not only would not have been done by any of these other people, but the only reason people realize they could be done is because of Donald Trump. Like, do you understand how many A-list political careers were destroyed by Donald Trump? Apparently, people People don't understand this because on the other side of that coin, they also don't understand how many political careers were only made possible because of Donald Trump, including Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, which I think DeSantis even understands, by the way, which is why even with all of these people whispering in his ear, trying to get him to try to take on Trump in 2024, even DeSantis understands that that would be political suicide for him, which it would be. So I don't think it's necessarily going to happen, but I still think it's good for us to prepare for if it does, since that's what's being implied by all the actions of the GOP right now. But all the DeSantis people, they don't understand why that is, why that may be. They just want to share the articles. Oh, DeSantis takes on big tech. Oh, uh, DeSantis actually gets stuff done. And then you look at the bill, it just like legally defines what a social media company is, among a few other things, but it ultimately has no teeth. Even Greg Abbott, nobody likes Greg Abbott. Even Greg Abbott's big tech bill actually had some teeth. 
It actually protected Texans, gave them the ability to fight back against being censored on social media by these big tech companies, as opposed to just political candidates. But nobody made this big epic display about it because they're not trying to prime people for Abbott 2024. But that's how they ran the story for DeSantis. Oh, well, but DeSantis is better at governing. DeSantis is better at wielding power. Why are you attacking the best governor in the country? Is this the case? Can we have this conversation now? Do you understand the difference between governing in a red state versus governing as the commander in chief? Do you understand how terrible the average Republican governor is? You probably don't even know the names of these people. They are so bad at their jobs that yeah, DeSantis looks great by comparison. This is the guy you wanna carry, not even carry the torch, you want him to steal the torch. This is the guy you want to steal the torch, the guy who frankly is the best of an overall not so great situation. Like this is your guy. And again, I'm not criticizing him only the way they're portraying him. Is he really that great of a governor or is he just better than like the incredibly incompetent people that we have in the other couple dozen red states? But hey, maybe I'm wrong, right? I could be totally wrong. Okay, I have another question. What is preventing more from happening? DeSantis is a great governor. Why can't he be greater? Think about it. The Florida state legislature is controlled by Republicans and by a significant margin, and it has been for a while. Like there are over 30 more Republicans than there are Democrats in the state house. There are about seven more Republicans than there are Democrats in the state Senate. These state congressmen are typically very right wing. So why isn't more being done? Bro, it's not that simple, obviously, right? So what do you expect to happen in DC with far less advantageous margins and far more extreme attacks? It's a totally different ballgame. And I want DeSantis to succeed. I wanted to make Florida even redder. So why aren't they banning Drag Queen Story Hour? Why aren't they passing bills that challenge gay marriage, forcing a Supreme Court ruling? Why aren't they forming entirely new statewide curriculums? Why aren't they enforcing obscenity laws to protect children from pornography? Why aren't they banning schools from indoctrinating children into LGBT culture? Oh, well, you know, there was that don't say gay bill, right? Which said you have to just wait until fourth grade for that. That bill was toothless. Oh, hey, we just have to wait until fourth grade to discuss anal sex and genital mutilation with children. Like that was already the case. When we got the puberty and sex talk, we were in fourth grade. That was the first time we got that talk. Now they're just making it into law because no one would have ever even thought to do something like that. That depraved and perverse to our children as recently as like a decade ago. Like it never would have even occurred to them that we would have to take like this preemptive action to prevent it from happening. And they're not even saying that you can't teach them about the sexual perversion, just that you have to wait until they're eight years old. So it's even worse than I had. And again, I like Ron DeSantis. Nobody likes Ron DeSantis more than me. That is a fact. What'd you say about DeSantis? He's a fine governor, he's doing a great job, but we have to push these people to their absolute limits. I wanna read articles praising Ron DeSantis for sending in state police to these gay bars that are hosting the drag events for children, not him like legally maneuvering to define what a social media company is. I want DeSantis to become everything that these people are accusing him of being. I want him to start the state militia up or whatever they were freaking out about a little while ago. I want that to happen, but he's just not the guy to take the torch from Donald Trump. Like look at the migrant busing stunt. Yeah, great media opportunity, but once he starts to get some pushback from the left, he stopped doing it. But this is the guy who's gonna make a stronger stand against the establishment than Donald Trump with worse margins than he already has to work with, let alone who's gonna be surrounding him. Like liberals are delusional, we all understand this, right? That they are fundamentally misaligned with reality. Conservatives will leave blue states because the living conditions are actually terrible, but liberals will leave blue states when the living conditions get to like Mach 10 levels of terrible, but you can actually prevent them from moving to red states by just making them even redder. Like 55 year old dried up wine ants in California will more likely than not refuse to move to Florida now because of the like abortion laws, because of their perception of it as this like right wing extremist hub, literally the handmaid's tale, etc. And two years ago when this wasn't as obviously the case to them, they were more likely to move there and they did, but you can actually erect an ideological barrier around your state that will prevent these people from even considering a move to there. Plus, it then acts as this like barometer for how the other dozens of red states are supposed to be governed. That's what we need. We need to get redder. Liberals will leave red states because they're like offended by the sentiment from the politicians or the general population who isn't reading articles from the Hill and the Huffington Post, etc. So not only will making red states even redder increase the quality of life within them, but it will also literally cause a mass libtard exodus from the state. Now here's something interesting. Oftentimes I'm guilty of this. I stand by everything I've said about it, but oftentimes we wanna just roll our eyes and outright dismiss everything that boomer types tend to say about the constitution, the federalist papers, states rights, how we need to just get back to that. And you know, they go on and on and on. We just kind of roll our eyes at that. Think about it instead like it's your villain arc. Like this is the law 
Now figure out how to use it to punish your enemies. Me and the boys over here getting radicalized by the Constitution. James Mason, try James Madison. You need to be getting redder. You need to be passing laws. You need to be legislating constantly. State militia, banning predators, deporting illegals, new curriculum, reopening the mental asylums. You need to be unwelcoming. So the bottom line is that governing at the federal level is not similar to the state level. And people want to make it seem like that. It's not only that it's different, but the impediments that you're going to face are directly related to how threatened by you the political establishment is, let alone who you're attracting, who's surrounding you. And you can say what you want about Trump, but ironically, one of the greatest criticisms of Donald Trump is that he started to surround himself with the same class of people who write the note cards for Ron DeSantis. He lost his touch for a second there. So you can talk about governing all you want, but who's a better leader? Ron DeSantis will push back on the most extreme manifestations of leftist overreach, and people call him a good leader, maybe a good governor. That's a lot different. Donald Trump shattered what was the paradigm a virtual consensus for decades within right-wing politics in this country. He's the sole reason we're talking about a lot of the things that we're talking about today, and that is because he is a good leader. Trump inspires the base more than any Republican in our lifetime. He gained in 2020 with non-white voters, great, but he lost a lot with working-class white people. Why? Because of pandering, which came from the GOP establishment. Those advisors, the same class of people who orbit Ron DeSantis. Yeah, I mean, it turns out that letting black criminals out of prison doesn't exactly inspire working-class white people to get up and vote for you. Like, I'm sorry. I mean, if you want a good yardstick for what a post-Trump GOP would look like, yeah, Trump listened to Kushner too much. Yeah, criminal justice reform, big mistake. Now imagine a Trump administration where he let Jared be in control of everything. That's what a post-Trump GOP would look like. Oh, well, that would never happen. Really? Ron DeSantis is backed by the same assembly of political insiders, donors, corporations, special interests, all these things that backed Jeb Bush. Why? because the professionally organized Republican class knows what they have in Ron DeSantis. And he's brand organized, he's packaged, and he's managed to deliver on their intents. I mean, you know, maybe he doesn't realize that, maybe he doesn't want that, but the fact is that that's the role he's been cast into. This is undeniable. You know, most of the people who were given jobs, money, and influence during the Trump grift, now they're pretending that they weren't like so excited when John Bolton was hired, which caused good people to resign. And now these same people are the most eager to highlight all of the alleged Trump failures and return to the pre-Trump status quo. And you can deny that, but ask yourself this, do you really know better than these people? These people who have been working in high level GOP politics for decades, these people have all sold us out. They've actually thrown effective, authentic conservatives under the bus time and time again. Now they're all betting on DeSantis and you're like, ha, you fools. I have a heightened perception of the situation. I know the true 4D chess that will levy war on the corrupt GOP establishment. Like, yeah, Okay, bro. Meghan McCain supports DeSantis. David Frum supports DeSantis. Jeb Bush supports DeSantis. Jonah Goldberg supports DeSantis. Why? Because they want to get back to business as usual, which is to say they're trying to regain control of their party. These people are very good at gatekeeping good people from their system. If they smelled a threat, he would be out, let alone a threat so big that it's got you like all excited in the first place. Like you think you know something that they don't. And who are we even kidding? Like imagine being such an imposing figure that everybody's role in the party is decided by what their standing is with you. Like you can say, oh, well, this guy's the real leader. All you want to, everyone else is reading the room. And when Donald Trump goes to war with somebody, that person no longer has weight in right-wing politics. That's leadership. That's true sovereignty. And people like to forget that Donald Trump destroyed an entire class of GOP rising stars simply by being that good. People forget that leading up to 2016, everyone was talking about how awesome and cool Marco Rubio was, and Bobby Jindal was, and Scott Walker was, and Nikki Haley was, et cetera. People even thought that Donald Trump was a Clinton plant to destroy Marco Rubio, the true threat to the swamp. Give me a break. And when's the last time you've heard about like any of these people? Basically never, especially compared to their standing back then. You typically only hear about them if it's from some teenagers like, dude, trust me, bro. Haley Scott 24, bro, trust me. And even Megyn Kelly gets it, you know, I've always liked liked Megyn Kelly. Here's the truth, and I hate to say it, but nobody who doesn't follow politics regularly would ever say the words, I think Ron DeSantis should be president right now, unless they live in Florida or something. But even then, they probably just want him to stay as governor for as long as possible, which would mean he would have to wait until 2028 to run, which is something we'll be discussing as well. But what? Oh, Trump's too polarizing. We need independence. Independents don't have opinions on socialism. Sorry, they really just don't care. That doesn't resonate with them. Unless you're talking about ending the forever wars, building a wall and kicking out illegal aliens and stopping our country from getting ripped off, you're not gonna win. Oh, John Doyle thinks that you can only win on Trump's message. No, John Doyle thinks that if you're going to try to steal the torch from the most popular political figure in the country, then you're going to need a message that is nationalist or stronger than that. And again, again, 
not necessarily hating on DeSantis. I'm giving him every opportunity not to play the role that the establishment is grooming him for right now. Like, I want to like him. But it's just not even the same. Frankly, it's not even close. If DeSantis ends up playing the role and trying to take on Trump in 2024, then sorry, but it is total war on DeSantis. And what will be even more interesting is seeing how all these MAGA influencers react to that. Because if you turn your back on Trump, then the last seven years have been for nothing. Because nobody would honestly argue that people love DeSantis because he's more extreme and more bold than Trump. Like He's meant to pivot. They'll say, well, it's about better governing. It's about, uh, you know, government, whatever. It's not as relevant as people think. Like George Bush was better at governing too. It's about what that represents. What do you represent as a leader? It's about leadership. It's about who can inspire loyalty and who can inspire a better vision for the country. Electability. It cannot be overstated how much the Trump base, aka the American people, requires a figure to not be in the establishment for them to get that momentum behind them. And DeSantis is a template of a GOP career politician. That's not inspiring to people, I'm sorry. The myth of Donald Trump is a once in a lifetime source of inspiration. The man who descended from the golden escalator on Fifth Avenue with his supermodel wife to call our political establishment stupid, to call illegal aliens criminals, and to promise that above all else, we will make America great again. He is the greatest American currently alive today versus what? A guy who made all the moves to become a career GOP politician, becomes governor, goes along with the COVID lockdowns and everything, but then he more quickly than other governors said, you know what, let's not do this anymore. Based? Yo, based dark DeSantis? Sorry, nobody's gonna get off the couch for the first time in a decade to vote because they were like really inspired by this legislation to target Disney or big tech or something. Americans hate the political establishment. They've given up on voting. You're never gonna get the turnout and the energy unless they truly believe that the person they're supporting is going to get into the swamp and tell everybody to go F themselves. Policy, agenda, that's all downstream from that. Nobody gets excited by that. They weren't excited by the economic brilliance of the plan to build a border wall without having to have our taxpayers foot the bill. They were excited because it was a middle finger to Mexico for letting their country be used as a port for tens of millions of illegals to flood into our country. You might disagree, you are not the 50 million white people who chose not to vote in 2020. If you want to inspire them to vote, Donald Trump is the best option right now to do that. So if you're gonna pass the torch, it better be to someone close to Trump's level. And Trump better be ready for it to be passed in the first place. But that's what they're trying to do, I'm afraid. But you've seen all the signs. Even just the other day, you know, Twitter's featuring the Financial Times piece. Who is Ron DeSantis? Donald Trump's most likely Republican challenger. The Florida governor came to national attention with an unorthodox response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Since then, he has harnessed a combination of intellect and calculated hostility to become the man of the hour for America's right-wing populist movement. They've been doing this all across social media. They're speaking so nicely about him, which is great but it just raises some questions. When has social media ever treated Trump like that? Let alone put it front and center. You've also got the RNC. They're spending thousands of dollars on fundraising emails to divide the base and push out fake polling about DeSantis beating Trump in 2024. The NRCC would only send out emails like that if they knew for certain that DeSantis was planning to run in 2024. So the GOP is actively trying to kill off a Trump 2024 election. They may have decided to back DeSantis over Trump. Meanwhile, all these people continue to fundraise off Trump's name. You're seeing this in the media too. They've been talking a lot about Trump versus DeSantis. Why? They would barely entertain Trump versus Biden as a legitimate contest a couple years ago. It's because they're trying to insert DeSantis into the run. Oh, well, they covered Trump too. Everyone knows that Trump is running. The only reason to bring up DeSantis is because you want him to run instead. If you were actually a threat, you'd keep it quiet, right? You wouldn't want to give him any coverage. They covered Trump because everyone already knows Trump. He was a household name. He's a cultural icon. They're friends with him. It was entertaining, et cetera. They had no choice, but they didn't take him seriously. So what happens if DeSantis gets in? Everything just goes back to business as usual. He's in DC. Maybe you get a tax cut like with Trump. Nothing significant gets done. Now, Florida's back in the hands of the neocons. Nothing gets done there. We have no frame of reference for what relatively competent right-wing governing should look like at the state level. Meanwhile, Trump is demonstrating that he's learned his lesson. His messaging and rhetoric have been so on point recently. He's surrounded surrounding himself with all the right people, all the people that he knows he should have been surrounding himself with in 2016. He's talking about purging the bureaucracy, installing loyalists in key positions. This would be huge. This is actual war on the deep state. And again, I know this isn't popular right now, 
because people like answers that make them feel good. Like, you know, Trump couldn't do it, but if we simply elect Ron DeSantis, well, then he can do it. It almost shows an insufficient understanding of how deep the rot in this country actually is. The president only has so much direct power in the executive branch. Like you need a guy who's talking about going in there and reshaping it like Lincoln, like FDR. And that's what Trump is talking about doing. But again, these DeSantis people, they just have this fundamental faith in the system. And then you've also got people who are like, there's no political solution. And it's like, well, all solutions by definition will be political. And I don't think that the total collapse is gonna go quite the way you would like. But look, I don't know. DeSantis is great. I like a lot of what he says, but he is a return to normal. There's no other way to put it. All the never Trumpers want DeSantis. Trump is censored on social media. He's censored on television. They censor his rallies because he's the only figure who presents the opportunity to shift things far enough outside of the status quo to where actually very positive things could actually be accomplished in this country in the timeline that we have, which is limited before it becomes even less possible. Would DeSantis present some opportunity? Yeah, but it's it's not that much, you know? I just don't understand what the argument is for DeSantis over Trump. Like, what have I said here that's incorrect? If you don't like Trump, that's fine. But you're painting a dishonest picture of what DeSantis is as a political figure. It's mostly well-meaning people doing this, by the way. Many Florida residents, there's a bunch of obnoxious teenagers as well. And then you've got your, like, straight-up establishment shills. But, like, come on, DeSantis could never rally like Trump. People would listen and be like, oh, yeah, I agree with that. But the energy wouldn't be the same. And this isn't an attack on DeSantis. Again, 99% of politicians are like this. It's just trying to understand how uniquely good Donald Trump is. But ironically, the biggest argument against Trump is that he's lost his 2016 touch precisely because he's now listening to and getting his talking points from the same class of people who write the note cards for Ron DeSantis. You understand that, right? This is not DeSantis' fault necessarily, more so the people who support him, the pundit class. You know, They don't want their liberal friends to disavow them. They don't want to lose the invitations to the exclusive parties. They don't want to lose career opportunities, opportunities to appear in prestigious publications, networks, etc. It's ultimately just going to be status quo talking points. Maybe a bit more on the edge, but we're not talking about what we all know is true. These people are bringing crime and drugs. They're rapists. They're coming from whole countries. We're just going to go back to Mitt Romney's position, which is just being against illegal immigration, but then maybe we're going to focus on it a little bit more. And people try to mock this. They're like, <laughs> so your strongest argument against DeSantis is that he's too establishment and that his congressional voting record indicates that he's a neocon and that he's too soft on immigration. Like, bro, yeah. Like, that's not good. They literally think that this momentum just exists. And if we only had DeSantis to carry it, sorry, it's Trump's momentum. And if he goes, it goes with him. And they take this for granted, of course, because many of these DeSantis stands are teenagers who only got involved in politics because they were captured by that momentum a few short years ago, likely in 2020, or the lead up to it because of Trump. So yeah, the biggest weakness for DeSantis is that he just has no independent power whatsoever to stage a national campaign. And so if he wants to make moves outside of Florida, he's gonna be entirely beholden to the worst people in the world. And even worse is that against Trump, these people would actively seek him out. So he's got a small chance in an open field, but otherwise he's on a collision course with a very deep political ditch. Whereas Trump, he's beholden not <laughs> to not so good people as well, but it's different because with Trump, it's mostly his family. It is what it is. It's kind of funny, at least. Most of the things that Trump does and says are funny. You know, people underestimate how important that is. Charisma, Trump is the most charismatic president since probably JFK. And people on the right don't want to acknowledge charisma because we think, well, the best ideas should win. But then coincidentally, they still worship Ronald Reagan, who is also very funny and charismatic less than Trump, but still. And I mean, you're talking about NFA Reagan, no fault divorce Reagan, America's an idea Reagan. So just goes to show what a little charisma can do for you. And Trump's charisma is like maxed out. He literally had a missed me moment like every day he was in office. I mean, his tweets, his rallies, the guy's just hilarious. It's a huge difference. DeSantis doesn't have that off the cuff ability that Trump does, you know? He'll never have a uh, only Rosie O'Donnell moment, which for Trump is like just another day. I mean, he's got thousands of those moments. And even DeSantis's epic moment, like the other night, you can see him glance down at his note card to, to read a line that was written by a staffer. Like he just doesn't have the charisma or the meme energy that Trump does. And that's fine. Nobody does. Trump is the best. DeSantis can be the best governor. That's fine. But these people just can't let that be the case. He can't just exist as a competent governor. As the most competent governor, they have to like manufacture this huge right-wing media campaign. Epic DeSantis owns the libs. DeSantis, dark DeSantis, the Ronald goes after big tech. And it's so tiring. You think if you guys nominate DeSantis, they won't just go after him next? Look at that, Trump really is in the way of everybody, isn't he? But this is literally what these people believe. They believe the establishment is so afraid of DeSantis that they literally thought that they raided Trump to increase support for him 
because they'd rather run against Trump than DeSantis. Oh yeah, baby, Dark DeSantis, the Ronald, the Ron. DeSantis tells liberal journalists to get with the program, epic own. No, the opposite is true. They're trying to help DeSantis, obviously. They're trying to make Trump too problematic to run so that conservatives go with somebody less controversial and therefore less threatening. Because like we've been saying, how problematic a political figure is in the eyes of the public is almost exclusively related to how threatening the establishment believes them to be. Nobody is a saint. We've caught these people like like literally worshiping demons before, et cetera, et cetera. But the worst they've got on Trump is like, maybe he doesn't pay his taxes, give me a break. And again, DeSantis is a fine governor, but he's establishment. There's no other way to look at it. He's a career politician. He's never created a value added product. He's never built anything. Donald Trump is a once in a lifetime phenomenon. Comparing DeSantis to him is actually laughable. I really mean that. It's actually like a funny thing to do because it's absurdity. Like it's a literal comically misunderstood interpretation of our current political dynamic in America. Like any governor in this country who resides in a red state could get their act together and be on that level within a couple months. Nobody in this country could do the same with Trump. There will never be another Trump. He could never be replicated. And you'll notice the people who are willing to have the Trump versus DeSantis conversation, they always frame it like, oh, DeSantis needs to stay in Florida for now. Let Trump finish and then bring in DeSantis. Like, as if they're even comparable. Honestly, I will support Donald Trump until the day I die. It doesn't matter if he backs down on issues or whatever. He's the reason we're talking about these things in the first place. It took a self-funded billionaire household name to do it, but now we've done it. By that metric alone, he has my loyalty, let alone the fact that right now he's the best option we have. I understand there's a future. Blake Masters could do it. Kerry Lake could do it. Notice how the establishment isn't propping those people up, only DeSantis. Both of them are objectively better. Instead, every media outlet is trying to convince people that uh, DeSantis is more Trump than Trump. Trump, but effective. The rational choice for 2024, sorry, nobody's more Trump than Trump. Nobody actually believes this. This is the role that they're casting DeSantis for. Maybe he doesn't know it. He probably wanted it, honestly. I mean, he's a career politician, literally. That's, that's what these people do. Knowingly or not, maliciously or not, if he becomes the character that they try to use to stop the Trump revolution, which it is, he will be the biggest traitor in right-wing politics because he would enable them to do what they've always wanted, which is to get away with stopping Trump. I am begging you with tears in my eyes, do not fall for this. Ron DeSantis is doing great work in Florida, but he has not proven that he's a genuine threat to the system. In fact, by any metric, it would seem that Ron DeSantis, the Yale graduate, DeSantis, the Harvard graduate, DeSantis, the lifelong career politician, DeSantis, the military officer, doing service behind a desk, but still campaigning in his combat gear, DeSantis with the average congressional voting record, this guy's being embraced by by the establishment of the Republican Party, even by the establishment Democrats. But no, the argument is literally, they kicked Donald Trump off social media. They fortified the election from him. They're putting him under criminal investigation. They sent the FBI to raid his private residence in Florida. Do me a favor, read the writing on the wall. Don't you get it? They're doing all of this because they want everybody to get angry. They want everybody to double down on Donald Trump to prevent the real threat to the establishment, which is Ron DeSantis, AKA the Ronald, from becoming the nomination in 2024 because they're terrified of running against him. But they can't set off any alarm bells in the meantime, which is why DeSantis isn't being targeted the way that Donald Trump has been and is for the last five years, don't you see? Like these are the same people who thought that Trump was the Clinton plan to stop Marco Rubio. Like it just doesn't compute. There's a lot of very significant reasons to believe that if Trump got back into Oval Office, it would be a lot better than last time. But even ignoring that, he had a great economy. He reduced military conflicts, he reduced immigration by half. But even that aside, it was the atmosphere that he created for this country. It was fun, it was hopeful. We really believed in ourselves again. And all of the worst people in the world revealed themselves and just how hateful and vicious they are towards normal Americans. Americans. How could you not support that again? This man is still living in their head rent free almost two years after leaving office. That alone is enough to make the whole thing worth it again. Like, why would you want to go back from that? He looks these people in the eyes and laughs in their faces. He mocks them. It doesn't matter if some other guy can do it, usually after referencing a pre written note card. What matters is that Trump is the face of it. He literally drove these people insane. He represents all of the hatred that these people have for their fathers, for normal people who enjoy their lives and aren't miserable. Like we said, so much of that power that these people have over us is completely dependent upon perceived legitimacy. Remember, they're the experts. And there's nothing that is more powerful in combating that. Not even rebuttal or arguments is more powerful than this. Literally just pointing and laughing. That's why they hate Trump.
Trump isn't the GOP figure who dignifies their self-perception by dealing with all their BS with respect and articulation. He just laughs at them and tells them to be quiet. He could get back in the office and just sit there and do absolutely nothing, and it would still be a net positive simply because of the atmosphere that he would reinstate within this country and the people who would be attracted to that and inspired by that and who would want to make America great again. I want that. The country needs that, but I'm afraid that the GOP is going to try to stop it. So we have to pay very close attention to how DeSantis and the GOP start to act after the gubernatorial election and the midterms are over because that's what they want more than anything. They want us to return to the conservatism of the Bush family. Mitt Romney, Paul Ryan, like, no, no, thank you. Sorry, I want Donald John Trump. The people want Donald John Trump. We will have Donald John Trump. He's the one who created this momentum. Why then would he not be entitled to it unless he wants to just pass it off, unless somebody who can do it better? Like, why would he not have a right to it? Do you understand how many people will just quit politics if the GOP betrays Trump? Then those of us who are into the cycle, we're just back to having to go like, oh man, you know, this Scott Walker guy seems like he could be pretty good. I'm refusing to do that. I won't go back, okay? We talk so often about how pre-Trump conservatism only focused on economic issues. It worshiped the free market. It worshiped capitalism. And every problem that existed was either A, not a real problem and should therefore be ignored. It's good, actually. Or B, it's just a symptom of insufficient economic equilibration, meaning if we just plug in free market orthodoxy, it's just, it's gonna be solved. Okay, well, uh, we kind of have like a million people immigrating to this country every year. It's kind of bringing down wages. Um, actually, boom! Increase in GDP creates more economic investment and therefore jobs, and it also brings down costs, which offsets the labor surplus and therefore stabilizes wages in addition to overall increased prosperity. Boom, epic laser eyes. Okay, uh, what about crime in inner cities? Oh, well, if we just elect more based free marketeers with laser eyes, they're gonna deregulate the economic zones uh, and, and that's gonna cause increased economic investment, therefore more competition, which will bring uh, more goods at lower costs and, and also more job opportunities, which will be more accessible in crime. And then the inequality is gonna be alleviated, which will stop crime because the Gini coefficient says that inequality is what causes crime. Uh, boom, epic, epic laser eyes. Okay, what about race riots destroying those businesses every time a criminal gets treated as such? Ignored. None of those things actually worked. They made sense on paper, which I guess is all that matters when you work in academia or at a think tank. And so in hindsight, it's easy to see how this class of conservatism, which was predominant for decades, failed to actually conserve anything because its emphasis on economic issues in effect framed everything as basically an issue of class, which as we know is the only way the left views the world, insofar as the prescription to any problem is to just allow for a hypothetically greater chance to access a higher material standard of living. It looks at the left saying, everyone's the same, the system produces unequal results, therefore it is unjust. And instead of directly refuting that, it just offers, well, if you give it a little elbow grease and make good decisions, you'll be okay. It's, it's this idea that people are all pretty much the same, they're all pretty much good, and so problems that we face can all be traced back to artificial disruption of incentives, which is caused by big government. And of course, this is flawed, because people are not fundamentally the same, they're not fundamentally good, which we're supposed to recognize as conservatives, though to be fair, it does make sense because this whole like free market orthodoxy is liberal. It basically says that there are no problems so long as your material standard of living is hypothetically on track to increase. And even if there are problems, and even if it's the usual suspects causing those problems, well, it's just because their standard of living hasn't quite increased yet. Just wait for it to kick in. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay. In abortion, same-sex marriage, pornography, preying upon children, drug addiction, there's no serious answer to that. Oh, you wanna stop it? Well, you better just write a really popular book telling people to stop doing those things. Hey, stop being bad, the book, because we can't use the government. How dare you even suggest that? How dare you interfere in someone's consensual economic transaction? How dare you disrupt the free market? It's literally worship. The same way that the left worships divine equality, which is a lie, this worships the idea that the system is fundamentally just and stable so long as people have equal opportunity to partake in it, which is a lie. Getting off track here. But yeah, of course it failed. Like it was never designed not to fail. It was never designed with intention to conserve anything beyond itself. Anything goes so long as our economic orthodoxy remains intact. It failed to take into account the importance of conserving the identity of a nation, which ironically led to its own obsolescence as it turns out that, you know, when you're importing millions of consumers each year, uh, the identity in the long run is gonna end up transcending that pretty significantly. And when they're not getting the same outcome in your system, they're not really gonna care about your arguments on how it's free and just, how everyone has the same 24 hours in a day, cold shower. They're just gonna vote it out of existence. This is the kind of nonsense that we're supposed to go back to.
you know? Or maybe it's that, but framed in a way that's slightly funnier, articulated in a way like it's supposed to mimic the working class dialect. They want Trumpism without Trump. But Trumpism is about identity above all else. And the conservative intellectual class, they don't understand this because they're largely deracinated. They're a part of the laptop class, the anywheres instead of the somewheres. I mean, these are people who maybe feel like a vague connection to America as a country or an idea, but they don't really identify with anything more sophisticated than that as it pertains to a nation or like locally. I mean, these people leave their hometown, they go attend a university, they get a laptop job in DC, New York, you know, some other place. And then they end up befriending like agents of the regime and and they're able to do this because they can explain away the controversy from their ideology. They'll say, oh, no, 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 my reasons for wanting border security have nothing to do with identity and crime and drugs, but rather for securing wages for the working class. You know, I'm, I'm just like you. It's Trumpism without Trump. It's toothless. That's why it's permitted. And I hate even calling it Trumpism. It's not an ism. It's just Donald Trump. All the smartest right-wing people I know, the people who work in academia, the people who work in DC, the people behind the scenes that you've never even heard of, the Twitter anons, they all support Trump. And concurrently, all the dumbest right-wing people I know are in the same boat. You know, hot damn, I love me some Trump. Let's go, Brandon, yes sir. It's the people in the middle, the people who are so insecure in their intelligence, they just have to be cynical, like to prove something to themselves. That's one of the best parts about Trump winning in 2024, which he will. It would annoy the conservative intellectuals, just like they were annoyed when he won in 2016. Like, yeah, you know, the nature of elite conservative opinion has changed somewhat, but their annoyance at Trump remains constant. Like, these are people who even claim to hate the GOP establishment, but then they try so hard to articulate Trumpism into this, like, intellectual framework or ideology. They're trying to defend a respectable Trumpism or respectable nationalism or whatever, but still, they can't help but be annoyed by him. It's like when a band becomes really popular, but you were listening to them first and no one gives you credit for it. That's sort of the feeling that they're experiencing, I think. What's, no, I'm the smart political person. No, please, I've got it all figured out. You just have to listen to me. No, no, I understand that the best songs were on the independent EP, not the ones played on the radio. Like, shut up, enjoy the song, nerd. Like, these people are cut from the same cloth of the establishment insofar as they depend upon the overall implied legitimacy of the system to thrive in it. Without that, they wouldn't exist. They're controlled opposition. Even if for a living, they criticize a handful of defects within the machine, they never criticize the features of it, or more importantly, that the defects are features in themselves. Also, quit being lame. Hand in your cool card. It's fun. You think you're beyond being inspired by a great political figure? Like all the great political figures throughout history were just other guys? Like, no, there's a reason we remember them. It's because they were great men. Well, Trump isn't respectable. You know, he's the most respectable, actually. He's the greatest American currently alive. Fact. Well, he's a Trump fanatic. Yeah, he's my hero. But look, here's the deal, Jack. I'm not unreasonable. I know that someone's gonna have to carry the torch and I'm completely open to that, along with the possibility that they perform better in office than Trump himself. But I will ask again, is the one who's gonna carry the torch the one who will only respond to the most extreme examples of leftist overreach and extremism? That is not even remotely in the same league as Trump. Also, Trump just has the it factor, simple as that. Like you can try to mimic it, you can try to quantify it or theorize it or reduce it to abstraction, but ultimately it is Trump. It is his essence. There's something about him as a figure that is so compelling. The high IQ people might be able to better articulate what that is, but regardless, we're all compelled by it. It's the Trump silhouette, the hair, the gesticulation, the speech pattern. There will never be another Donald J. Trump. If you don't recognize what makes him so special, you should retire from contributing to the discourse. Like, stop taking yourself so seriously. People take themselves way too seriously in this business. Their ego will not allow them to speak this highly of a political figure. That's fundamentally homosexual, just like complaining about baggage. Like, what baggage does Trump even have? They played virtually every card they had on this guy in 2016. There was no, well, we should keep a few in the chamber in case we need it later. No, they exhausted virtually every piece of information. And what's more is that once that was done, they began embellishing information, calling in favors, then literally just making things up and running with them. So any baggage, that Trump has is now more or less in reference to everything that they've been throwing at him since this guy was in office trying to run the country. There was the Russia collusion hoax, which the average Democrat voter literally believes is true that Russia installed Donald Trump into the Oval Office. Of course, nothing came from that. Uh, remember, you know, it was supposed to be Mueller time. And then there was the call to Ukraine, which they impeached him over. Of course, those two things don't exactly square geopolitically, which we found out since. But of course, the masses 
don't care if they don't understand. <laughs> you know, typical NPC behavior. Uh, you know, there's the indefinite tax fraud scandals, January 6th, et cetera, et cetera. Like there was literally no point during this man's administration where he wasn't dealing with some hoax, which of course never came to fruition because they had nothing on him and the whole thing was totally made up. But nobody thinks about that. What they think about is how often each one of these completely manufactured scandals was occupying the bylines. And so this then calcifies the perception of Donald Trump as this totally corrupt, totally problematic figure, which was the intent from the beginning. Like, sure, if they could have indicted him, that would have been great. But ultimately, it was more just about incessantly painting this guy as problematic and corrupt because now you've got all these people who are like, of course Orange Man is bad. What, what do you think they were just running nonsense in the media for the last seven years just because they didn't like him? Y yeah, yeah, actually. That's why when people are like, oh, the baggage, like it cannot be overstated. It doesn't exist. It's totally manufactured and it was manufactured by your enemies. It was invented. And when you concede that as legitimate, you not only play into their framework and show the same cowardice, which the American people, specifically those who are sympathetic to our ideas, which they rejected that cowardice in 2016 through their vote for Donald Trump. Like, sorry, nobody who cast their vote for this guy in 2016 or 2020 gave a single jewel of thought to the Access Hollywood taper about, oh, the McCain war hero comments, anything they had in their arsenal, because none of it mattered. And they certainly don't care about any of the hoaxes that were manufactured during his administration. So when you talk about electability, when you talk about baggage, don't betray yourself by projecting your own cowardice onto the rest of us. Because Donald Trump didn't destroy the Bush and the Clinton and the DNC and the RNC, actually, all those political machines in 2016 by practicing respectability politics. Because people in this country know the incumbent regime is not worthy of that respect. People weren't voting for the first time in decades. People weren't paying attention to politics for the first time in their lives because because they thought Donald Trump was a sophisticated and respectable statesman. It just didn't happen. They did it because Donald Trump said, we're gonna build a wall and we're gonna make the Mexicans pay for it. He told Jeb Bush that the towers came down under his brother. He called Hillary Clinton a nasty woman and said that he was gonna throw her in jail. He said our leaders are stupid. He showed no signs of fear against a hostile political establishment. Oh, but then based Ron DeSantis told the reporter to stop politicizing his hurricane response. Based, Q centipede, you can't con the Ron. You can't con the Ron. Okay, you know what, honestly, this is all just a rat nationalization. It's Trump because he earned it. It's his movement. In this stage of American politics, Donald Trump is the equivalent of a founding father. Oh, I'm a vaccine. I'm a simping for Trump. You don't get it. You don't believe in greatness because it makes you uncomfortable or something. He could have done whatever he wanted for the rest of his life. Anything he could imagine himself wanting to do, he could have done it within 72 hours of having imagined it. Think about that. He could have cut a deal with the media. These media executives, they would have allowed him a peaceful and respectful exit so long as he quits, but he didn't. He kept going. Oh, well, he's not a good man. Yeah, he's a great man. I'm not over here saying like, wow, I just really love the way he stayed married and faithful to one woman. Nobody's perfect. Everybody in their lives is going to do something pretty terrible, probably even a handful of times. But Trump has demonstrated sacrifice and fortitude that is exceptional. And that is therefore worthy of praise. If you can show me somebody else who can say that, then I'll take the MAGA hat off. But until then, the MAGA hat stays on, metaphorically. People have no concept of loyalty anymore. Testosterone's down 50%. We're like scratching our heads at where all the loyalty went. It's an inherently masculine trait. It's probably the most important masculine trait other than piety. You know, men who aren't loyal, that's as like disturbing as men who dress up like women. It's the same thing fundamentally. It's unnatural, it's disordered. You're pond scum. Everything that this man has done to advance the prospect of authentic right-wing politics, and people are already wanting to abandon him to what, like go back to the GOP status quo? Trump could have abandoned us and gone back to being a billionaire who can do literally whatever he wants, but he didn't. He's put up with all of this crap nonstop for seven years. When Trump is out of office, we can nitpick, we can evaluate, whatever. Until then, he will always have my support. And then from there, we can figure out who's next in line. But right now, it's Trump. And everybody knows it's Trump. Trump's endorsement makes or breaks political careers. It made DeSantis. Before him, it destroyed Bush. So many others. Who am I to deprive Trump of glory? That's a noble thing for men to pursue. Donald Trump wants to be the man who puts America back on track, and he might actually pull it off. He loves this country. More importantly, he wants revenge against the people who destroyed it and tried to destroy him. I've seen polling recently that's got him at the highest uh, approval since like 2020. Like, when has this ever happened? When else has this ever happened? This man's out of office. Maybe you disagree, but again, you're not the 50 million white voters who sat out in 2020. Trump has the name recognition. He's the only one who can provide a solution for the general feeling of contempt that people in this country have towards a system that they know has failed them. That's why 
why it can't just be a more polished Trumpism. MAGA is an identity which surrounds Donald Trump himself. MAGA without Trump as like this abstraction or ideology, it's impossible. There's no Trumpism. It's only Donald Trump, which is to say that when Trump is done, there will be successors. That's fine. But to try to artificially reconstruct Trumpism and sell it to voters, that's just foolish and wrong. But in the meantime, nobody actually believes that we're going to be blessed with somebody who's better than Trump to carry the torch right now. But we need someone at least approximating his level in the future. There are some rising stars, other good governors too. Frankly, Kerry Lake is far more on point than Ron DeSantis. And because I'm saying that, you know it's not just all about Trump. It's really about who's doing the best job. And she's also a woman. So you know that for me to praise her, she must be doing a really good job. But the media doesn't treat her as favorably because she actually appears to be a threat. I mean, she's an outsider, a threat to this class of people who has given us mass immigration from the third world, who has taken lives and trillions of dollars from our economy for their international democratic experiment, who's hollowed out the interior and the soul of the country, all enforced by people who largely do not have American heritage and who hate our country and who hate our people. Our base knows that. That's why Trump is actually electable, because Trump is better on the issues that win over independence in addition to our base, which absolutely loves him. And there's no evidence that DeSantis is as good on the issues as Trump. In fact, as we said, his congressional record suggests he's basically just going to side with the establishment on those issues. And you could maybe make the most suburbs argument, but people have become very aware of the threat that the other side poses to the well-being of themselves and their families. And I think they're really beginning to understand how high the stakes are at this point. And, you know, they're just going to want the biggest, baddest kid on the block to be the one who's going to bat for them. Because if it's Trump versus systematic indoctrination into despair and self-hatred out there in the suburbs. You really think parents are just gonna sit that out? Unlikely. I, I can't even think of a single place that DeSantis would do better than Trump, except for maybe Florida. But Trump would still win Florida anyways when he's the nominee. So like, who even cares? Look, see, no one cares. Just like that. Nobody cares. No one cares. He's a fine governor. But like we said, when he was a congressman, he was basically just an establishment, typical Republican, meaning that nothing really stood out. In other words, nothing really challenged the status quo. Think about what that means. Think about what that cloth is like, because that's the same cloth that enables the managed decline of our country. That's the same cloth that has failed you so spectacularly that you now have to take time out of your day to actually think about arguments as to why children should not undergo genital mutilation. Think about that. Why would you trust them to do anything if they couldn't even prevent the most obviously evil thing from becoming a mainstream pillar in American political discourse? Like, this is an actual idea that's being entertained, even increasingly so. You now, as a parent or as an aspiring parent, literally have to take time out of your day to strategize how to keep your kids away from this indoctrination because those who profited off claiming to represent you could not figure out how to hold that level of degeneracy back. And sure, he's against illegal immigration, but not legal, not mass immigration. Sorry, not good enough. What do his actions as a congressman tell us? He followed the Republican Party then, and his actions since Trump has taken over the Republican Party prove he's still just following the tide. He's a follower, not a leader. Donald Trump is a leader. Only Donald Trump. Only. Oh, he's America's governor. Because he, like, pushed back against leftist extremism. The DeSantis stands. They give me such a hard time about this because they're teenagers. Their political education only began a few years ago, so they don't remember that Rudy Giuliani was America's mayor after 9-11. He was universally celebrated. He was a beloved political figure. He remained popular long enough to be a front runner in 2008, years later, but he didn't end up winning the nomination. You've got very promising people entering the scene, people like Carrie Lake, Blake Masters. We're just supposed to discuss Ron DeSantis like his campaign in 2028 is inevitable or even desirable, let alone the fact that some people want him in 2024. No, if he wants it in 28, he's going to have to fight for it. And if he wants it in 24, he's going to destroy his political career. And if the GOP does what I think they're doing, then that will be the greatest betrayal of their base yet. But people neglect that. That very extraordinarily obvious fact. Do you know how many people have said that they're basically going to be done with politics after Trump? Even my dad said that. Like, why should he not? What has the GOP ever done for him? We're in an echo chamber. We are people who take a very strong interest in politics. We are not the average American. Quite far from it, actually. What does that tell you? When Paul Ryan's top three picks for president are Ron DeSantis, Glenn Youngkin, and Tim Scott. But yeah, DeSantis is the real threat to the establishment. Even when Glenn Youngkin won in Virginia, you had people talking about how this is the real GOP. We don't need Trump. And now these are the people who they immediately want to be president, talking about how Trump was an embarrassment to the Oval Office. No, what's embarrassing is that anytime a government governor wins an election, you're immediately like, huh, well, this man deserves to occupy the office that was held by George Washington and Andrew Jackson. Like, at least Trump is a truly larger-than-life figure. He captures virtually all the energy in any room he walks into. And then you've got these establishment GOP clowns 
who can recite arguments from Milton Friedman and Henry Hazlitt, and, and that makes them a better statesman than Donald Trump? Who are you kidding? Only other establishment GOP clowns actually believe that. Normal Americans who are sympathetic to our ideas don't actually believe that. They want Donald Trump. Like, you can prop up any other figure you want. You can talk about how epic they are, totally blasting the libs. You're like a progressive parent trying to get their boy to play with dolls. It's just not natural. You're forcing it. It's not going to work. You'll indoctrinate some of the weaker minds, yeah, but you can't fight the reality of it, which is that there is no better political figure right now than Donald Trump. Tens of thousands of people wait in the freezing cold outside of the building where that man is speaking. He's not even in power right now, where he's delivering rallies. Until somebody else can do that, I don't want to hear it. Now, what other situation would you have your side so fired up and your enemies so angry and bitter and afraid and think, you know what, we really need less of this. It's a ridiculous proposition. So they're probably going to try it. They won't be successful. Trump will be the guy and we will keep our momentum going far beyond Trump, far beyond the cries of the haters and losers. And pretty soon that class of people won't even be able to work in politics, let alone do so prominently. And finally, you already know what I'm going to say. We will make America great again. It's a historical inevitability. The momentum has shifted in the last seven years. And look at where we are now because of Donald Trump. We know how vicious our enemy is. We know what the stakes are. We've overturned Roe v. Wade. We're about to end affirmative action. The most popular news show in history is talking about our ideas. Just imagine where we will be in 10 years if we can keep this up. It's going to appear to be worse just like it appears worse now than seven years ago as the illusion shatters. But what's important is what we're assembling behind the scenes. Who's being inspired? What is being inspired within people? And when the time comes, we will in fact make America great again. Hey guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications so that you are notified in the event that we post, which is so often, folks, and share the video with a friend. Share the video with your favorite, you know, maybe lower IQ Trump supporter. That's me. You know, I might be able to articulate this in a way that's like relatively high IQ. I'm the low IQ Trump supporter. I'm let's go Brandon. I'm love me some Trump. That's me, okay? I'm not... I, I'm the low IQ Trump fanatic. I'm the cultist, okay? I, I, I play the role and I do it well, frankly. Many people are saying this. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to speak about Trump highly. You know, I allude to it. We talk about it. But the last few months off, I've, I've really meditated on this and I've seen a lot of what people are saying about Trump, who they're comparing to, who they're comparing him to, who they're propping up. And it's like, there's something deeply offensive to me about that. Um, it's just like, it's ungrateful. I mean, Donald Trump has done so much. And then even on that, he's still the best guy. I'm like repeating the points of the video. Whatever, it's the two minute outro, okay? You stick around for this uh, specifically. So I hope you enjoyed it though. I mean, yeah, I'm pro-Trump. Um, but you're gonna see it. You're gonna see the, the, oh wait, hold on. Excuse me. What was the way that this was articulated? December Tides, Doyle's Winter Campaign. You will see, you will see the content. Uh, you will see greater content. You will see more content, more frequent content. I know I've been saying that for quite a while, but uh, I mean, hey, I offered to explain and, and you chose, you chose to uh, not have the explanation. And you were very charitable in the language that you employed when you said that. I think you said something about, please proceed with whatever excellent content you've prepared for us. And I really appreciate that because people don't really understand the preparation that goes into this and really the excellence that it does display. So I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that. It was very kind of you. And, you know, you might say there was something of like this sort of illusion of choice that went on there. No, I mean, you had the cursor, you had, you had a, uh, agency. Our, our Calvinist members might even say that you were predetermined to select that, that dialogue option. So anyways, thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. Wait, so hold on. That was weak. You know, first video back in a while, you know, that would be, that would be a disgrace. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. Boom.